ceases to have power for, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Now hold the table. It is 60, six, 7 o'clock, excuse me. Good evening. Welcome to the Allington School Committee meeting for October 9th, 2014. This time I'd like to welcome Valerie Saracen, the AE representative. I would like to take a moment to remind all of you spectators and members of the committee that there will be a state election for all administrative offices, our state senator and representatives. There are six questions, four statewide and two related to Arlington. It's important that you make yourself aware of who to vote for and educate yourself on whether you want to vote yes or no in each question. Each household received a red voter information booklet from the state last month. It only addressed the individual people uh, running for office and the uh, four state questions. I have asked the town clerk to post the town question number five so that you can become familiar with it. If you go to the Arlington Town website, then click, click on calendar, then events, and then elections, you should find the question. I believe in a strong democracy, and that can only ha be maintained with an informed electorate. Thank you. At this time, I would address the members and the audience uh, to the artwork we have in the room. <clears throat> right on this side uh, is paper weaving. This is Muse's art second class created this display of artwork. Var various types of paper were collected and used. Recycled calendars, magazines, maps, and discarded art. Uh, weft, warp, loom, mesh, pattern, shuttle, rhythm, center of interest, and balance and undulation and repetition. In the back of the room is a study of skeletons. Students painted with tempera paint on brown craft paper, which is a medium ground of value plastic life's replica of human skeleton was their source of observation. Value, range of value, wet on wet, dry brush, ground, proportion, observe, shade, highlight, and define. And on this side, uh, right over here, d digital photography one and two. Students in the visual arts department at Arlington High School are encouraged to explore multiple aspects of each discipline. All are expected to develop a personal voice with thoughtful and meaningful expression. In digital photography, students apply their knowledge of elements of art and principles of design to a variety of subject matter and techniques. Nature, film noir, and the style of portraiture, photojournalism, corporate branding, and the history of photography. Using scanned film, digital imaging, Adobe Photoshop, and Illustrator, students create a portfolio of work as part of their application to college and learn about careers in commercial and fine arts photography. Please go to our class website, ponderimage.com, to see the variety of work. All I ever had was eight Crayola crayons in school and a piece of art paper, 15 minutes a week. I envy these students. Okay, um, at this time, the next item on the agenda is, uh, let me make sure I get it right, sorry is uh, the Poet Laureate. Okay, and I am, please bear with me. I am still learning how to do my part. Uh, okay, the, uh, let's see. Last spring, the Arlington Town Meeting established the position of Honorary Poet Laureate of Arlington. Appointment of a Poet Laureate shall be for a term of one year, annually renewable for a total of three years based on the recommendation of a screening committee of five persons consisting of one person from each group. The school committee, by a majority vote, gets to appoint a member of the screening committee. If there is a member of this, our current committee that would like to be that appointee, we can appoint that person tonight. Do I have any volunteers from the committee that would like to be this? Okay, seeing none. Then I would ask uh, Mr. Schlickman, Chairman of the Community Relations Committee, to uh, seek out a person that you can bring forward, hopefully on the 23rd, uh, for us to vote on. Okay. okay. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on uh, to uh, public participation. Uh, Mr. Foskett, come up to the table, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Honorable members of the school committee. My name is Charlie Foskett. <clears throat> I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 8 and vice chairman of the finance committee. 
1991, with John Billifer, I launched the rebuilding of our school system infrastructure. In 2000, with school committeeman Dennis Sullivan, Selectman Jack, Har uh, Jack Hurd, and I, we secured your support for the rebuild debt exclusion. In 2005, Jeff Thielman, Diane, Diane Mahan, and I secured your support for the largest override in the state history at the time. All because we supported the education of Arlington's children. Chairman Bill Hayner, Treasurer Steve Gilligan, and I now ask for your support for no CPA tax on the ballot question number five in November because we support the education of Arlington's children. The CPA tax is a massive slush fund with no identified, no identified line item purpose serving third parties, not Arlington's community safety, education, public works, and social services. Its alleged reimbursement scheme is an underfunded, doomed Ponzi scheme that has woefully missed its targets in the last six years. The minimum cost to taxpayers is $8 million in the first five years devoted to this slush fund. Over a 30-year period for, for, for amortizing the bonds for New Arlington High School, this diversion will be $88 million. $88 million taken from voters that could be used for living expenses, college education, or 401k plans. This tax is fiscal irresponsibility on a scale unknown in the history of Arlington. And it may well cause the Arlington High School project to fail. Supporting this reckless referendum jeopardizes the rebuilding of Arlington High School and the operating override that you and I know the school and town will require within five years. Taxpayers defeated two Arlington High School referenda in 70, 1975, overrides in 1987 and 1989, and again in 1997, the first $50 million debt exclusion for our elementary schools was defeated. The 2004 override was defeated. My message is that Arlington voters will not be happy with this $88 million slush fund diversion that threatens their core services and the education of their children. I ask each of you to vote no on the CPA tax and to take a committee vote recommending the same to Arlington taxpayers. Your charge, the education of our children, is now at risk. If this $88 million slush fund passes, what will you tell the parents of our students when an override fails and you have to cut services? What will you say when a voter asks you why you supported this travesty? What will you say to an eighth grader looking at an aged high school that has lost its accreditation? What will you tell her? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harrington. Good evening. My name is Stephen Harrington. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 13. I haven't been here for almost three years. Now, the last time I was in front of this board, I urged you to drop the full day kindergarten fee. After 10 months of fighting me on it, our free full day kindergarten became a reality. And it saved Arlington parents more than a million dollars a year from a needless tax. The reason I'm here tonight is to try to save Arlington's taxpayers from spending another million dollars a year needlessly on the Community Preservation Act. Another unnecessary tax that the members of this committee want to foist on Arlington's parents. Let's face it, Arlington's school committee has a history of making financial blunders with taxpayer money. Your unbridled support for this partisan effort shows that well, some things haven't changed in three years. The message that you're sending to the community is that the passage of this unnecessary tax is your highest priority. Most of you voted last spring to replace, to place the CPA tax on this fall's ballot, ahead of asking taxpayers to rebuild the Stratton Elementary School, ahead of asking taxpayers of upwards of $100 million to rebuild the Arlington High School, ahead of being compelled to rebuild the Minuteman Regional Technical High School for tens of millions more dollars. How do you explain to the Stratton school parents that your priorities are with buying swampland in East Arlington and not building 21st century schools? How do you explain to a high school parent that their children will be forced to try to learn in an antiquated facility, that you drain the well of public generosity and raise rents all over town to provide housing for, well, unregistered sex offenders. 
Seeing your partisan non-education related efforts and your liberal use of Arlington School Committee designation on a partisan website would make Horace Mann turn over in his grave. This school committee runs the real risk that CPA will be inter interpreted by Arlington's parents as this committee can't prioritize appropriately. Furthermore, the underhanded tactics of some committee members to bully others who wanted a fair, open, and public discussion of this committee's involvement in the ballot question, bullying conducted behind closed doors and far away from public scrutiny is reprehensible. I'm making a formal request from this committee tonight for a written explanation of your actions in this regard. Uh, you have 14 days to comply. Good night. There's no one else on the public uh, speaking time, so we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, youth Risk Behavior Survey. Ms. Bavier, come forward, please. Hello. So, <coughs> Colleen Lucia will be joining me in just one minute. We had a parent forum evening that she went to go um, introduce the speaker to, but she'll be joining me as well. So I believe that you all um, have the Youth Risk Behavior Survey yes. and have seen it. Mm -hmm. So um, just briefly, we started the Youth Risk Behavior Surveys in 1990, early 1990s, and um, depending on what year it was, we were trying to do it every other year, and um, we lost funding for a little bit there, so we, uh, it was stretched out a little bit. For the, but for the past five to seven years, we've been doing it every other year at the Audison and at the high school. And last year, um, the high school was administered, and the survey results are in. And it takes a look at um, what the risks are that our, that our students are um, engaging in. And, um, and we'd like to then move this on to not only the school committee, but the parents and the staff, and um, have the students talk about it in advisories as well. So uh, it was originally funded by the tax, the tax grant, and um, when Colleen comes, she'll talk a little bit about um, the grant that she has that's helping to support that at this point. And in off years, we, we found various ways in order to support this, um, this survey. And this survey is measured up against what the state actually um, administers as well. The state does a sampling from different communities across Massachusetts. Um, all in all, we feel pretty encouraged by what was on the survey this year. We feel that all, le all areas have improved, although we are very cautious to say that some are still in the forefront of our minds. Um, so we do have priorities um, as well that include um, some, a lot of social emotional health, um, self-harm and suicide. There's some in, some in the substance use um, area that we, we'd like to talk about. But we also um, are very encouraged by our students' physical activity, um, how they're feeling pretty much about themselves, uh, how many students are involved in sports, either in Arlington or outside of Arlington, and um, the number of hours of physical activity that they're getting outside of school, the high school students. So um, I, I'm sure when Colleen comes, she would like to talk a little bit about um, the grant that supports this and reapplying for the grant. But I guess I would open it up for questions and dialogue with you if you would like to me to focus on one area or another. Ms. Yes, um, yeah, I mean, what I see as the most scary aspect of the study is certainly the issues about self-harm and suicide. Um, and, and I see that it's not that different from other districts in the state, is from what I saw, right, from the comparison. So, um, and yet the numbers feel like they're crisis level. If 20% of all females are self-harming or cutting, it just feels like that's a crisis situation. And I, and I wonder, I know that the gun bill that Governor Patrick signed um, requires us to do suicide prevention and um, issues around mental health. And I just wonder, you know, what, what are we doing to rally What are we around? doing? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So... Um, some of the some of the areas that that um, address this topic specifically, if and there are probably many others as well that I'm not even aware of that that, that address this. But um, the areas that I'm directly involved in 
Um, we have health classes in grades 9 and grades 10. Um, our physical education teachers are, are teaching health, and they're directly um, speaking to students about stress, about the impact of, of stress, about um, self-harm, mm -hmm. and, uh, and about resources that we have within the community and within the school that can address some of these. Last year, our health and safety day was um, completely dedicated to suicide prevention. We had an evening for parents. We plan on doing more this year as well, um, but, but that day was dedicated to that. We have instituted a um, critical care supervisor um, at the high school now that's dealing directly with these. Our school nurse and our social workers are very involved in, in most of these things. Um, we have individual counseling. Like I said, we have parent forums. This, this uh, coming month, AYCC is actually going to run a training again on just this topic mm -hmm. and has invited all of our social workers and our counselors to come to that as well. Um, we, have, we have a really open guidance department and a very supportive um, mental health program here at Ellington High, and we, we do do our best. Ms. Starks? Um, that was my question. Yeah. Mr. Pierce? Um, one, one question I had regarding <clears throat> use of electronic devices. Mm -hmm. I had heard somewhere recently that there's a, a new firewall or something that can be put in place, a, a fence or something, that would help protect against harmful texting or bullying through, uh, you know, sending, sending inappropriate messages. Do we have use of that yet here at the school, or is that something that's being contemplated? Kathy? Let me, let me talk to Thanks, that. Dr. Okay. It's the, the fence you're referring to is very specific to one t form of social media. It was called Yik Yak. Oh. And actually, I'm going to have a letter out to parents about this. Mm -hmm. there, it is a site, social media site, where you can do anonymous postings, which is what is very problematic. Um, there was such an outcry about it that Yik Yak themselves um, put up offered to schools the ability to put a fence around. It's really just a firewall. And we have done that in all of our schools. Um, in fact, we, we sort of got out in front of that even before they did put it up. We, we initiated that. We, we do have firewalls. Um, now, the thing that in, in the school, to the extent that we can, I think that parents need to become aware of this because they need to see what's on their children's phone. I, I, one thing I would advise all parents to do is one, check their, their, their child's phone regularly. Do not let them have their phone in their, their bedroom overnight because some of the worst bullying and, and, and goes on at, at night. Um, and parents just really need to be very proactive about this because it's, it, and if you were talking to Chief Ryan here, he would tell you the same thing. We're, we're, keeping, we're just always keeping up with it. Every time you see a new site like this that it can be very dangerous, other ones are appearing. So uh, it is a very serious thing, the kind of cyberbullying, the sexting, all of that that's going on via the Internet. And, and, the, and parents really need to be the, uh, actually it's a very protective thing to do. Um, we're doing the best we can here at school in, in that regard. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, two things. Um, on the st uh, stress and depression number, we're reporting 44.6% of our young women at Arlington High feel they are under too much stress uh, most of the time, and it's very much a female uh, issue here. Um, what, what are our thoughts on that? Well. Um, and I think that the majority of, are saying that they're under more stress um, due to academics mm -hmm. and, um, and homework. And the, that percentage was a little higher than it was um, from parental pressure, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. And so um, what we're doing is we're offering supports, we're offering as um, the learning center, we're offering um, you know, a, a wide variety of courses. It's not he always healthy to sign up for four or five AP classes. Mm -hmm. Our guidance counselors are talking to students all the time about balance. Um, and 
and not thinking that they have to take five APs and to, and, you know, in order to get into the, the best college they could possibly can because not all students are, are built for that. <laughs> so, um, you know, through our guidance counseling and through our health education classes, we're, we're addressing that as much as we can. And the other number that worries me is on the, the, the suicide numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we uh, working with students to, uh, to uh, uh, prevent the, those kind of occurrences? So um, we have had um, stress groups. We have had groups where, where students can join, but sometimes mm -hmm. students who are under the greatest amount of stress don't join those types of groups. Uh, but we have had we have had small groups. We offer individual counseling. Um, like I had mentioned before, the caseworker. Um, uh, we have an at-risk caseworker who's working with our students this year, um, and she has a she has a background in in psychology as well. Um, we we do a lot of um, sending students out for outside resources as well. We have a couple of social workers on staff that are working with students. Uh, we work with advocates. We work with AYCC, and um, and we just try to support them as much as we possibly can. I hope our young people understand that high school isn't forever, and uh, <laughs> no matter what, uh, th and there's help available if you're feeling overwhelmed by it, and just make sure that message is out. And I, I think even yesterday we did our health and safety day. Yesterday was. Um, was geared more towards technology mm -hmm. and the use of technology and, and how it's changing culture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and our social worker, one of our social workers, got up prior to um, the assembly just to introduce herself, mm -hmm. just to be sure that all students had a face to what a social worker might look like mm -hmm. and what they might do in, in, for, for students. So yeah. um, mm -hmm. we, we constantly try to remind them of the types of resources that, that are here. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was also concerned, as Mr. Schlickman was, about the number of people who identified saying they had actually attempted suicide. And I'm wondering, how good are we at identifying those students in the classroom, or I mean, they're, you know, in the school, as opposed to anonymous on the survey? Mm -hmm. Do we know all seven out of 100, or how many would you say we know? Well, I think that, I think that the, the implementation of the advisory program is helping a little bit to, to create just one more person that the student has. Now, of course, not 100% of students may click with their advisor, but it is a, it, it's an opportunity for a smaller group and it's an opportunity to gain a relationship with one more person in the school. And, and that's what it's all about, is gaining relationships with the one more person. It doesn't matter whether it's you know, the person who works in the cafeteria or the person who is teaching AP English or if it's your advisor, whoever it is, as long as you have a relationship with them, those staff know where to go to if they're concerned about a student. Mm -hmm. Right, but I'm still wondering, how many of these seven out of 100 do we know about? I, I don't have that statistic as, as to actually how many are reaching out for help yeah. with it within the school. I'm just wondering um, how many are just suffering can, in silence or? I, I, can, I could gather that data for you that, um, that actually go to see one of our social workers and, um, and, and that being the main issue, is that they're, they're stressed or they're suicidal. I can get that information for you uh, because she, they, they have that at the end of every year that compile that data. But it certainly is not 7% yeah. yeah. okay. that reach out to somebody within the school mm -hmm. always. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> When I, what I looked at, and I, I, mean, I want to make sure I get the numbers right, I look at the trend reports towards the end of the report and the attachment in the, mm -hmm. in the back, and it seems like there's, I mean, there's, there's some positive uh, trends. The, uh, you know, cyberbullying is down from 18% <clears throat> to 14% from the last time. Cyberbullying is down from 9% to 6%. Stress is actually down from 38% to 36%. Do you, <clears throat> I, mean, I guess the question I have is just a general question. It, it seems like some of the trends are going in the right direction. And uh, so first of all, is that true? Uh, and secondly, what do we need to do to keep those trends going in the right direction? I, 
I do believe it's true. Um, and I think that the validity of the survey, um, since we've been giving it for so many years and we've actually seen, we haven't seen huge spikes and huge decreases, which, is, which helps in, right. in knowing that it is valid. Um, I, I believe it is, it is valid. Um, I think that it's, it's surprising sometimes to see some things have decreased when we've changed our Massachusetts legislation on marijuana use, and that has decreased as well. It's so decreased, that's encouraging yeah. that we're, we're talking to our students constantly about these behaviors. Um, we hope that, that, that we're doing a good job talking to the students, and we hope that parents are doing a good job talking to their children. So one of the things that I, 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 would, I would encourage you to think about is, you know, you talked about the advisory system, you talked about, you know, all, the, I mean, really the, the, the key to, the key to, it seems to me, the key to decreasing these risky behaviors is uh, developing deeper relationships between students and adults in the school. So what I would encourage the district to do is to keep thinking about how can we, how can we keep doing this? You know, how can we be more uh, intentional about developing uh, positive, appropriate relationships between adults and, uh, and students in the school, in, in the high school, and that I think is the is the point of reflection for the leadership of the the school and the district to keep the trend going in the right direction. I completely agree, mm -hmm. and I think that through the um, extended um, amount of clubs that we have within the school with with advisors. I think with the two deans that we have and the assistant principal that we have, they have um, phenomenal relationships with students. They're always in the middle of the, the student body. They're never sitting behind a desk in their office. They're either in the cafeteria, they're out in the hallways, or they're meeting with a student. And, um, and I think that the resources within the building are, are plentiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm hoping that through those relationships, advisories, clubs, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, that, that we'll meet the goals. Okay, thanks. Well, all my good questions have been asked. I'm down to the cigarette question. Uh, it's gone down Pretty 12, good, huh? Yeah, it's gone down 12% in, in four years, <laughs> which surprises me because I'm just hypersensitive. I thought it, this was gonna come out higher because I've seen it. I, I just see a lot of kids, uh, teenagers smoking a lot. And uh, is it just the, I know it's hard to say one thing, I, I know we have a strong education program in place. Is this a result of the continuous education program, in your mind? Uh, I, think, um, I, think, I think it's a combination of um, society mm. and um, advertisement about the dangers of smoking and about education. Okay. And it's become really not cool okay. to smoke as much anymore because you know, if 90% of the kids don't smoke and 10% do, they really don't care to be around it as much. Mm -hmm. So I think Colleen could talk more to that. And Colleen I apologize. Is, is, no. I, I explained where you were. Yeah, and no uh, Colleen has been working with the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition on a lot of the substance use issues. So I, I told you tell them about the grant too. Oh, that's great. And certainly with regard to the cigarette use, um, we're seeing decreases nationally. Um, and it really is, it's cultural. It's it's the anti-advertisement. Um, it's the general awareness and, and the research that has come out. And, and even in Arlington, it's the policies. So now that the age of purchase has increased, you know, first to 19, moving to age 20, um, the town is taking a strong stance on, um, you know, preventing young people from getting addicted in the first place. Uh, so policies, education, I think it, it all contributes to um, these decreases that we've seen over the few past few years. Um, a little bit about the Drug Free Communities Grant, which funds the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. It was awarded um, initially in 2008, a five-year um, grant, and then we were renewed this year. So the coalition will have another five years of funding, and it's significant funding. It's $125,000 a year. And the coalition um, is represented by people from the public sectors, the community, private sectors, parents, youth, um, it's about getting everyone in the community involved in this, this effort, which is really about um, preventing and reducing underage drinking and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, like here in, in, in the schools, that it's about building those positive relationships between um, <coughs> students and staff here. But it's beyond the school's responsibility, really, to address these, <coughs> these issues. It's the
the whole community <coughs> that it will take to really mm -hmm. um, continue to see these numbers decrease. Um, and it's, it's about all community members really forging these relationships with, with young people, being aware and feeling confident enough to um, address it within their homes and to communicate about some of these tough topics, um, substance use related um, and other risky behaviors. And it's about policy development. It's looking at sort of the attitudes, the practices here in town and sort of reflecting even within institutions, you know, what could be improved to restrict access um, and to change how we perceive um, young people and young people engaging in these, these types of behaviors. So I really see it as a community effort, and I certainly don't think it, it really falls entirely on the schools. I agree with that. Um. Yes. Oh, I just, uh, I think the things about cigarette and illicit drug use and alcohol, it is a real success story. And as you point out, it's a mul we've had a multifaceted approach. There's been a lot of money um, and a lot of people involved from the administration, the town, the kids. And I guess I just wish we had that around things like suicide and self-harm, which feel more hidden, and yet are, are at a crisis, it feels. And, and what we could do if we had that kind of multifaceted approach with grant money and, <laughs> and so would be, could be quite positive. Uh, I yeah. completely agree. Something tax to get the money. <laughs> <laughs> and it, with, with those types of issues, and, you know, there's so much stigma still attached. Yeah. So really. So it's it still would, quite, yeah. It would help to get yeah. a community approach to, to show that there's a lot of support yeah. um, and, yeah. and to communicate yeah. what the resources are to those young people who are experiencing those, yeah. those feelings and, and those behaviors. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. As a school system, we're really thankful to um, the Youth mm -hmm. Health and Safety Coalition for applying for this grant because mm -hmm. they provided the funding to be able to do these surveys for mm -hmm. the past five years and will okay. continue to the ne for the next five years to be able to they really drive um, an awareness level within the student body. Mm -hmm. It helps to drive curriculum. It helps to drive the needs in the community mm -hmm. and what needs to be implemented. So um, it is very helpful. Mm -hmm. yep. I, I just want to um, acknowledge um, what a, a huge contribution both um, Cindy and Colleen have made in these efforts. Uh, Jeff asked, what are we doing to move forward? There is no single thing, um, but I know that both of them as well as many people on staff in this building and in other buildings are always thinking about how can we improve what we're doing, how do we reach more children, how do we make those opportunities for adult contact um, more available. And that is what is really the cornerstone of a lot of be risky behaviors ending uh, it also is the source of great safety in a building because you know your, your students, you know what, what um, they may need. You can sort of be very proactive about that. And I, I think that they exemplify all of the, the great things that are going on and particularly the, um, the, the strong town school connection that exists in this community. It's really quite exceptional, I have to say. Mr. Pierce. Real quick, uh, just over the high holidays, uh, my, my rabbi said this a most amazing thing in his sermon, which was essentially coming out and talking about the issues that you might be having, which you think you're only having. And yeah. it's quite ironic because a lot of people around you are probably mm -hmm. having them. And the whole, mm -hmm. the whole motto of you are not alone is really what it would be great to see the schools continue to foster because I know they already are. But not only from the staff student bond, but, but the students mm -hmm. themselves and, and making sure that they know that their friends in their class are also having the same difficulties perhaps that they are and to feel open about discussing them. So just Each one of us seems to spur another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do you use this as a teaching tool, the yes, survey? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up one other thing I'd forgotten to ask before. Um, looking at the alcohol use, um, that has one other item that concerns me greatly, which is the binge drinking, mm -hmm. which is um, a child having five or more drinks of alcohol in a row within a couple of hours um, on at least one occasion during the 30 days prior to the survey. And I'm looking especially at grades 11, which had 24 
0.5% um, respondents reporting that, and grade 12 had 23.9. And those are scary numbers. I mean, all of them, the five, five drinks in a couple hours, that's not so far from alcohol poisoning for a not so, so big child or adult or, I mean, adolescent. Um, what are we doing about that? I mean, that's, that's what I would have highlighted tonight, too. So, you know, while the numbers have come down, both for current alcohol use and binge drinking, what we know about, especially among the juniors and seniors, um, students who are drinking, so who have had a drink in the past 30 days, 50% um, of that is in the form of binge drinking. So what that really sh demonstrates is that young people, they, they drink differently than adults. So, the, you know, there's the argument of, you know, maybe starting early, letting them, um, learn how to drink responsibly, but what we're seeing is that those who are drinking tend to tend to do it in binge form, um, and that's terribly concerning um, for various reasons, um, for you know, injury and driving. Um, so I think all of our efforts that really are targeting underage drinking are targeting binge drinking um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. And we Um, so that leads exactly to my question, which is how and when do we let students and parents know the results of this survey? So now that this has been done, um, we, will, we will post the uh, report on the Arlington High School website. And um, depending, depending on when the advisory is open, we feel um, it's probably best to do this in the advisory. I, I will give it out to the faculty as well. Um, so it will go to faculty immediately. It will go to it will go onto the website for the report. But as far as the dialogue between the students, and the students can have access, obviously, to the, the front of our website, but the actual dialogue will be dependent upon the, um, the next advisory that's, that's available. Um, have we ever considered having like a, a forum where we just have parents and students who want to talk about this and want to talk about you know what they're seeing and and what you know maybe have them come up with ideas of what to do or how to and that's certainly it. something it's something that the coalition has sponsored in the past typically once a year they try to um, host at least one community forum um, and in 2011 we focused it on the YRBS and I think certainly the co coalition could look into that for this year unfortunately it's, it's sometimes hard to get parents and young people to come out around these topics. Mm -hmm. um, tonight we have a parent forum on underage substance use, and maybe there are 20, 25 parents. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to get them out, and uh, certainly considering, you know, what are, how can we try to encourage that um, is, is worth considering. Just, a, just a quick thought on that. I, as a form, when I say former parent, I, I'm grandparent now. But getting out to a lot of meetings and stuff is very difficult. Mm -hmm. I realize there's a degree of privacy, especially in these kinds of meetings and stuff, but with our technology today or some, uh, something, to engage these people, possibly a, a, a discussion with minimal amount of disclosure and stuff, if it's videoed and made available, might engage other people in the future. Just a thought. Sure. It's just it's difficult. A webinar. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. A, web a webinar would be phena phenomenal. People watching can't Absolutely. see each other and, that and, way and can be able them. to engage. Uh, we, it's very difficult to get, especially the younger parents. Absolutely. Both parents working, come home, get the kids settled. I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you. So, I mean, anything that, to get the message out, get people engaged, webinar is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no limit on that, other than controlling who's speaking. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. I don't know that we've explored. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we've done it through ACMI, but I think getting it online mm -hmm. yeah. um, and promoting it that way, I think, could certainly and reach more families. I know that one or two webinars that I got involved, eventually I ended up going. I, I needed more because I needed to see the other people. Mm -hmm. So it helped. And the coalition has its own website now that has a, a phenomenal amount of resources on it mm -hmm. as well. And
I think as Mr. Pierce said, that uh, sometimes people, parents too, think they're the only ones in the world, mm -hmm. and their child is the only child in the world. And knowing, I mean, it's still your child, it's still your issue, but there is help out there. It's important. And to get through it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you so much for all the work you've done and all the people involved in this, and uh, this is exciting. I like to see the, the lines going down. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's Thank you again. Okay, moving on to state accountability. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Laura Chesson is going to give a, a, the overview. Oh, they're going to set this up. We're going to divide this report on MCAS performance essentially into two um, areas. One is looking at accountability tonight. We, did, we approached it this way last year. And then on the 23rd, we're going to have a complete overview of MCAS. But for those that are watching, uh, I have put on the district website the link to all of the state reports with the school profile. So you can certainly go in there and look um, at any of the data. You can look at the DART data, which is a comparison of the data among um, similar, school, a similar school districts based on a number of metrics. So at any rate, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Chesson. No, it's fine. Thank you. Um, so as Dr. Bode has said, we're going to split um, the report into two pieces because there's a lot of data that's um, available. We don't want people's eyes glazing over. Um, so tonight we're going to focus on specifically on the accountability analysis. And, and folks mm -hmm. at home may recognize that when we talk about it being a level one school or a level two school. Um, and so we'll go over why each school has the level uh, designation that it does and we'll go into much more detail next week about um, what our response is going to be in and more information about the percentage of students scoring at each level um, on the MCAS test specifically in the areas of math science and uh, English language arts so we'll talk a little bit about our overall accountability goals that the school committee has set uh, talk about the overall PPI and the PPI over time. We'll remind everybody what those definitions, what those uh, things stand for. Um, talk about overall growth and then a little bit about individual school results in terms of accountability. Um, so the school committee has two goals that, many goals, but two goals that specifically target accountability and the first one of those um, is to close the achievement gap by attaining an annual PPI of 75 or greater for high need students um, in every school and to improve student achievement by attaining a student growth percentile of 51 or greater at each grade level in ELA and math. And I'll review one more thing. High need students include those students who are on an IEP, <coughs> Um, those students who are limited English proficiency or formally li uh, limited English proficiency and or students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And students are only counted once, so. Mm -hmm. And again, our overarching student achievement target will be that all our level one schools will maintain their level one status and that level two schools will make progress towards level one status. So just to review a little bit about the definition of PPI or the P Progress and Performance Index, um, it combines two metrics or two measurements. One is how we're making progress, closing the proficiency gap, and that's the gap between the percentage of students that are scoring in the warning and needs improvement on the MCAS and the percentage of students that are scoring in the proficient and advanced on the MCAS. We have two measurements that are around this metric. Um, one is a cumulative PPI, and that looks at how we did over the last four years, and it's a weighted average, so the most current year um, gets weighted the most, and four years back gets weighted the least. And then we have an annual PPI, which looks at how we did this year in comparison to last year. And this will determine what accountability level designation that the school is given. And there are some uh, school, uh, subgroup ratings that are given if there are more than 30 or more students that fall into that category. Sorry, question? Sure. Is it the cumulative or the annual PPI that determines the accountability level? It's the cumulative. It's the cumulative. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. It's quite all right. Um, so this year, if we look at our accountability data, um, our PPIs 
for yellow across the district. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the last the science one should say on target. So we're on target for all of the three major areas in terms of our PPI points. This will show you the cumulative PPI by each school and their accountability level. I'm pleased to announce that the Arlington High School has moved from level two to level one. Um, that was one of our big accomplishments for this year. Um, Audison is very close to being a level one school. Had they had a 75 for the left hand number is for all students and the right hand number is the PPI for high need students. And again, those are students who are either low income um, on a special education plan or are limited English proficiency. Could, why, yes, sir. Why does it say not available for admission? But they don't have enough students in those subgroups to provide a number in the high need subgroup. I guess he doesn't have a ha trauma have over that or anything. 40, isn't it? 30. 30. Yeah, that's 30. Okay. Do they have a trauma over that? Yeah, I don't, I'm I don't sorry, know. I'm That's quite right. Um, right. And the highest you can get is 100. The highest you can. Uh, actually, no, you can get. You can get, you can get credit points. You can roll Yeah, over. you can roll over. We've had schools get 113 okay. in the past. Um, so you'll see the level for each of the schools and um, the PPI for both all students and the high-need students. And then if we look at our annual PPI over time, again, you'll see Bishop has uh, not available for their high-need students. Um, but you can see how over the time from 2011, which is the first year of the four-year weighted average, to the um, 2014, how each school uh, received what they've received for PPI for um, all needs or all students or high needs. Any questions about these two slides before we go back uh, forward? Because these are the two that determine mm -hmm. the accountability level. Yeah, what happened? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Pierce fell off the map. Right. We're going and and as I said, we're we're going into more detail in just okay. a moment, and then talk about the action plans. Um, the thing I would like to call to everyone's attention is that if you have one school that is a level two, mm -hmm. um, then the entire district is a level two. And later, I will show you the schools that we school districts that we compare ourselves to, and you'll see that m most districts, that I think if not all of the districts we compare ourselves to, are in the same mm -hmm. situation where they have at least one school that's a level two. Mm -hmm. Um, also looking at growth data because that was another metric that the school committee had set a goal around. Um, this is our famous bubble charts that uh, folks like to mm -hmm. look at. Again, what you're looking for is you would like all the bubbles to be in the upper right hand quadrant or as close to that, which would indicate schools that have high growth and high achievement. Um, and of, on the bottom right hand corner would be schools <coughs> that have high growth but low achievement. Um, just about all of the Arlington grades um, will show that they are in either medium or high growth and high achievement. There's one outlier there for ELA. And in Wait, what are the different dots? I don't, I they represent different grades. I'm sorry. Each one of them represents a different grade. Hold on one second. And I will tell you. So the one dot that you see there over to the left um, that's sixth grade for ELA. Mm -hmm. So that would indicate that they, while they have high achievement, they had low growth this year, okay? Or comparatively high achievement. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, that will, um, that's the math, and those are each of the grades. And the two dots that you see, the one that's green and the one that's sort of gold that's right underneath it, right above the X, mm -hmm. um, those would be um, indicating seventh grade and sixth grade for math. So it isn't color coded. Is yeah, there a key someplace? Uh, we'll get to the slide where it's easier to see in a second. Thank you. So just to go, this this provides the information in a different format. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the medium SGP for ELA and math by grade, um, you'll see that in fourth and fifth grade, you'll see all the data there. Again, our target was a 51 for each grade in both subject areas. Um, just about every area except for English language arts at the sixth grade is either at 51, exceeding 51, or just about close to 51. We have 50.5 and 49.5 for math. Um, that was some significant increases in math. Yes? So math has been on our radar screen in the sixth grade. What happened with ELA? What, what's the 
Um, I mean, that, that we'll, number, either I forgot that we, that we were, had an issue there or-, or No, that's, that's a, a first time that that has showed up and we'll be discussing that mm -hmm. next time because we're time. gonna get into the detail. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about okay. it today, yeah. but more detail the next time we meet because that's a specific, because grade six is all in one school as opposed to grades four and five, which is a combination of all the elementary schools, um, we have more detailed information about that. That's to, next, next. Uh, meeting. The next school committee meeting, yes. Okay, okay. Tonight Sorry. and the next one, will we be able to see a comparison of the growth uh, from year to year? <clears throat> Or is that something we need to look on, on our own? That's something that we present when we present the next, next time. One. Fine. Yes. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Um, and then just looking by, <clears throat> as, at SGP by elementary school, um, you can see which of the elementary schools, it, it's supposed to be in red, it's a little hard to see on this chart, but which of the elementary schools that don't have a 51 um, in SGP in grades four and five, because it's comparing um, one grade to the previous grade, that's why there's only for grade four and five at the elementary school level. You, <laughs> for grade three. You're gonna do the drill down on that one too next week, so yes. next question. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is um, a little more detailed uh, growth data, um, and you can see the um, information in the color chart below, although I'm okay. sorry, it's a little hard to read. Um, but this is ELA, and again, the dot on the far left-hand side would be grade six. Yep. On the right-hand side, the two smaller dots represent grades seven and eight, and then the one dot in the center represents the entire um, middle school. Okay. And again, in math, at the middle school level, um, the dots are pretty much um, around the same uh, area because uh, the grade six has an SGP of 51, grade seven of 49, and grade eight of 60 for a median SGP of 53. So they're all about the same. And if I'm reading this right, the state average is 60? Or is it 50? I'm, I'm confused. The, on the, 50. To the right on 50. 50. 50. 50. So the number 50 represents 60%, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. And the bottom it. line of the graph <laughs> is just a straight numeric number? Thank you. Yeah. Um, we compare ourselves to other districts, and these are the districts that every year we compare ourselves to. And I just wanted to show you that every single one of the districts that we compare ourselves to, is, although they are high-performing districts, they are all level two districts because they have at least one or more schools that are level two. Um, also, if we look at the percentage, proficient, and advanced, these are the districts that we compare ourselves to. Um, and I also wanted to call attention to the percent of high needs um, because uh, that certainly the higher the percentage of high needs, the greater the challenge the district faces. Could you um, just do a similar comparison sometime uh, next time of the high schools in this group as well? Just high schools? Just the high schools? Sure, absolutely. That's I can bring that I with wanna, me next time. I want to tote the fact that we got a level one high school. Mm. <laughs> oh, and you want to look at what the levels yes. are? Okay, <laughs> I can certainly well, do I that. I bet you a lot of those districts do as well. But, well, yeah. it, it's possible, but I, I couldn't answer yeah. that question off the top of my head. Well, yeah. we're there. Um, the other thing I want to, that's not visible from this chart, um, but as I was reviewing the data, um, you'll, you'll see the SGPs over to the right, and for the vast majority of schools, what they're in one or two points of each other in terms of median SGPs. I, I, as I was preparing this chart, I noticed that within one or two points, school districts are pretty much where they were last year in terms of the percent proficient and advanced. Where within one or two points, school districts are pretty much where they were with median <laughs> SGP which basically says that the challenge that we're facing um, regarding student uh, population of students that are much more difficult to move forward in terms of increasing student achievement is not just our problem alone. And actually there was an article in the Boston Globe about this when they had the, um, the results. And we'll, did you have a Real question? Quick, I, sure. No, go ahead. No, I can go back. I it just, I noticed in Arlington we lost a student when they decided to take math. Um, some students um, may have come into the district between the time oh, one yeah. test is one test happens in March and the other test happens at the end of the school year, or they may have left the district. Um, so the numbers are not. Yeah, Belmont was dramatic. Are very rarely the same. We only lost one. Belmont lost twelve. Um, 
So again, in, for mathematics, as we look at this, um, we see that our percent, percent proficient in advanced compared to the other districts that we compare ourselves to and their SGPs. And the same thing um, I found in English language arts also exists in mathematics, that most dis that every single district, th I think three points was the biggest spread from one year to another. There's just not, had not been a lot of variation between last year and this year. So to take a look just briefly at our level two schools, and we'll go into even more depth than this the last time, but I wanted to let you know what pieces of the accountability designation caused each of these schools to be a level two. So if we look at Stratton, this is uh, two graphs of their annual PPI over time, separated the annual PPI for high need students as the annual PPI for all students. And again, um, you know, the goal would be to be 75 or better because you're looking for a cumulative PPI of 75 or better. Um, so you can see there's a lot of uh, ups and downs here. But just a second. Sure. I see a, a dramatic drop in 13, from 13 to 14, am I correct? That's correct, yes. But previous to that, if you look, you also saw that there was, prior to 13, it was low as well. So there's, there's a lot of variability. All students, but the, the, the high need students were basically a growth thing up till 2013. Right, but they actually scored t zero in 2011, right. so. Yeah. and so there was progress through 12, 13, and then Okay. Yeah. Can I just ask? Sure. It? So, SGP is growth. Yes. And PPI is what again? Closing the the, the achievement gap between the students mm -hmm. that. So it's about the gap between high needs and regular need students. PPI. It's about the gap between. It looks at two things. It looks at partially at growth. Okay, so there's two, so SGP is one thing, but it's also combined in the other thing. Okay, so it looks at basically at two measures. One is closing the achievement gap, which is the percentage difference between those students who score proficient and advanced and those students who score uh, needs improvement and warning. Mm -hmm. Okay, regardless. So, regardless. So, of, of high need status. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman, go right ahead. Essentially, it works like this. And because we have uh, all our elementary schools teach science, uh, this is how it works. Uh, each content area it go, is folded into PPI. And for ELA, you get a growth measure and an achievement measure. For math, you get the growth and achievement. You don't have a growth score in science, so you only work on achievement. What happens is the state sets a target CPI based on your baseline year of 2011 for both high need students and for, for, your, for the aggregate. And so you're being evaluated on that, on whether or not you reach or are approaching your CPI target. And that would be uh, for the, the that's the achievement portion. On the growth portion, uh, you're being judged whether or not you hit 51 for uh, as the median growth score. So they're both come into play. There's also graduation rates uh, and dropout rates that fold into the high school, but that's right. And there's bon there's much. bonus points. So if you if your original target, your baseline, mm -hmm. I'm just going to pick easy numbers for easy math was 50, and and your target at the end is 100 just eat for easy numbers, and there were five years in between, they would expect you to eat off 10 points every year. So that's your target. So if you meet, meet that, you get a certain amount of points. If you exceed that, you get a certain amount of points. If you make progress towards that, but you don't meet it, you get a certain amount of points. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you don't make any progress, you don't get any points. So, so it, and that's what PPI is. PPI is measuring that, how much better we're improving each year. How much you're eating off of the deficit, okay. the difference between along with your growth. So to okay. just stay even from where you were last time. You get some you, points. You, good, but I mean, you have to have some growth, don't you? Just to stay even? Well, you have to, if you, if you make no growth, you get zero. If right. you make some growth, but you don't hit your target, you get 25, okay. up, you get, so, I'm sorry. You am get, I wrong in looking at this chart right now Yep. that we not only didn't meet it, we lost points? That's correct. Okay. So I'm gonna well, go in. really good growth. Well, you could. Let's well, look at did. the next. I mean, our growth numbers are good. And our Across the board, but each school, um, we're talking about each school in, individually now. I don't okay. want 
So I apologize if I'm open. That's okay. The, the, no, I'm we're drilling. To, I'm we're, just trying to figure it out. I agree. It's, it's no, I want to understand. Yeah. It's two years, and I still don't understand yeah. GPI. Oh. Um, so if we look at our detail analysis of Stratton, um, be able to go to my notes. Uh, please ignore the last bullet. I didn't get deleted out of it. So they showed some good gro progress in student growth. And I'm happy to give you the detailed number reports, and they're also available on the Department of Education website if you'd like. Right. Um, but just to summarize, we showed good progress in student growth, but we didn't make progress in closing the achievement gap. And the last bullet should have been deleted. I apologize. Um, in terms, and this is for all students. In math, we showed some progress in narrowing the achievement gap, and we were above target in growth. So really, the problem with um, ELA for all students would be that you showed good progress, but you didn't show exceptional progress. Um, the other problem in ELA would be that we didn't make any progress in closing the achievement gap. So we're looking at two things, growth and closing the achievement gap. When we look at math, we showed some progress in narrowing the achievement gap, and we were above target in growth. However, if you look at high need students, we increased the percentage at advance. Remember, that's bonus points, so we got some bonus points there. We did not make progress in closing the achievement gap, and we did not show any improvements in student growth. Again, looking at achievement gap, closing the achievement gap, that's cutting down the number of st the percentage of students who are at warning and needs improvement. Okay, and in math, we did not make progress in closing the achievement gap, and we did not show any improvements in student growth. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so when Stratton was given the blue ribbon designation, was that as a result of the 2013? No, that was prior to 2011. That prior. But that was specifically about closing achievement gaps, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's, that's what that designation means. Right. So it was because we they'd made a little bit of progress in that direction in 2012, or is that what? For the, for the blue ribbon? That yeah, came prior ribbon. to any of these years that we're taking into consideration. Because it seems like previous years were even worse. Is that? It was prior to 2011. They made progress in the previous ye previous two years, but mm -hmm. particular progress in the year that they were designated. I see. And they had a metric for, you know, which schools had the highest, they had targets there too. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but as Laura said, it's before we actually are dealing with this particular data. Right, okay. Now I know we're gonna go into this a lot more in great detail, but do we think we did something in 2013 that we then stopped doing, or is it? <laughs> um, I know that having talked to the literacy, and we're gonna go in greater depth yeah, in two weeks, but having talked to both the literacy uh, folks and the math folks, um, Last year, Stratton, first of all, we're, we're starting to see the full impact of the Common Core, and I know there was a question last year about alignment with the Common Core. Mm. If there are 10 things that one would have to include in order to be in aligned with the Common Core, we have those 10 things in our curriculum. But there's a significant difference between saying these are the 10 things I need to cover, and this is how I need to cover those 10 things, and by the way, this is how I need to measure how if my students are making progress towards those 10 things, and how do I assess whether my students have mastered those 10 standards? Now, it's more than 10, but just to, just to give you some more information. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Stratton, last year they only had a math coach for one day a week, so we're feeling the full brunt of the Common Core, and we only have a math coach in there one day a week because we didn't have as many math coaches last year as we have now. This year they have a math coach in there four days a week. Um, in addition, we are, really um, upping our professional development around Lucy Calkins, um, and we'll go into more detail, but I just wanted to give you some of the yeah, information. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> so if we look at the next level two school, that would be Hardy. Hardy um, met its goal for all students, but it did not meet its goal for uh, high need students. Again, in terms of their high need students, there was no progress. Um, narrowing in the achievement gap, and we were both the target below the target for student growth. Um, in math, we made some progress in narrowing the achievement gap and student growth, and we did receive some bonus points for decreasing the percentage of students at warning and level um, at the warning level. Our next level two school would be Pierce. Again, it's uh, primarily due to the high need students. Um, in ELA, they were below the target for narrowing the achievement gap and below the target for student growth. 
Um, they made some progress in narrowing the achievement gap and student growth in math, and they did receive some bonus points for increasing the percentage of students at the advanced level. And you get those bonus points if you have an increase of 10% 10, 10 or more. And Thompson, over time, uh, looking at both the high needs and all students, did not meet their targets for last year. Again, for all students, we saw some progress narrowing the achievement gap and some good progress on student growth. In math, some progress in narrowing the proficiency gap or the achievement gap and some good progress on student growth. With high need students, we saw some progress in both areas and in math, we saw some progress closing the achievement gap and good progress on student growth. Um, one thing I'd like to call to attention with Thompson is in one of the subgroups, which is low income, they made some exceptional growth this year. Unfortunately, that was not mirrored all across all the subgroups. High needs, again, takes into consideration not only um, students who are in low income, but also students who are on um, um, special education plans and ELL students. <coughs> we had somewhat of a discussion on the this topic last year. This grouping is, is a grouping designated by the state, am I correct? That's correct. Thank you. Well, the one thing I want to interject, because it, it's, it's, it's very good to see all this, but um, they, these, these have targets. I hope that that's the message that comes forward, so that there are targets. There, they are mathematical targets that we have to achieve each year. Mm -hmm. So you can still be making progress and your scores can still be good, and you could be moving students, you could, you, as you will see in the actual MCAS data, but unless you make those targets, this is almost like AYP, but a different kind of way that we are now measuring it, and this is the way the state um, was able to negotiate not having AYP mm -hmm. by creating a whole new metric system, and that's what this metric system is. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you have that contextual understanding because it might seem like, well, the school, aren't the schools doing well? Well, actually, they are doing pretty well. So that's, that's the sort of the, the disconnect. And that's actually what was talked about in the Globe, too. There's that disconnect between what's going on with the leveling and these metrics and actually how, student, and how school districts and schools are performing. But if you're just looking at the graph, if it says the, all the students in a particular school in 2013 are 119 and now this year they're at 40. Yeah. I, I understand that, that there are a lot of intricacies involved in it, but this is very stark. It, 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 it begs questions that we, we're going to add Mm -hmm. that need to be answered, and I expect them the next time. That's true. I, I just want to bring you back to the, the two charts that I told you at the very beginning that were compared us to other school districts in terms of our percentage proficient advanced, mm -hmm. and, and also want to go back and talk about the Globe article, is that when you start having this, this you've you go, already got the low-hanging fruit, you've already got the students that are just below you know, a certain level, and you've moved them up, and then there becomes a point where it becomes very challenging. But the expectation in order to get to that level one, this is a prime factor in that. Yes, in that's, order to get I level mean, one, you have to make those rules. targets. That's where we're stuck with the rules. Right. But, I, I appreciate what you just yeah. said, and I think it's very important. Yes? I think um, it would help me a lot if we looked at these school by school, and that we could look at PPI and growth and actual scores and where, what their target was and all of that <coughs> on one page per school because I can't keep this straight. I have to go back and forth mm -hmm. and the numbers, I, I know the numbers don't tell the story. And so what I, what I need is kind of, I know that just because, you know, these numbers dropped. I mean, I know they indicate something, but it's really hard for me to understand what it means because it's so individual. Each one of these is individual to the school, to their target, to what happened in the school as far as, mm -hmm. you know, how many kids are in that whatever. I don't know. So I'm just having a really hard time wrapping my head around these. I mean, I want to understand them, but I, I, I keep going back and forth. I thought, you know, when I saw the growth numbers, I was really excited because I was like, wow, this is great. Look, we really had some significant growth in a lot of places. And then the PPI numbers were like, like what the heck? And so then, but then I can't quite figure out because I don't know 
the metrics that are even used to create right. them, so they, they don't mean anything, these numbers. You know, it's like telling me, I don't know, right. pick a I, number. That, okay. You know, you've assigned to them, and I'm like, great, I have no idea what it means. It looks sure. bad, but I don't know how, how bad. Like, I don't know what that right. means, you know? That, so. I, no, I totally understand. Okay. So I will make sure that for next time, when we have our next meeting, <laughs> that I will add charts that summarizes for each school the kinds of things that you're asking for before we go into the detail for that school, so that perhaps on a one page summary you can see, you know, this was the target and this is what yeah, I did. That would be great. That sure. would be great, because I, I do. I will organize it more by school. That would be easier for you yeah, to understand. Yeah. I will. I will do that. Thank you. Um, just talking about Audison, we showed um, growth in um, some of the narrowing of the achievement gap. Um, <coughs> it would have been higher, I think, without uh, sixth grade in terms of. But we did still meet the uh, target for growth. Um, we got bonuses for um, increasing the proficient. Um, and sorry, increasing the advanced and decreasing the failing. And again, on math, we were on target for narrowing the achievement gap, on target for student growth, and we received extra credit. Um, and science, we had good progress in narrowing the achievement gap. And so there was some significant, I know that that's been the, one of the committee's concerns, and we saw some really good growth in, in uh, math at Audison. So just at a very high level, and we'll go into more detail in two weeks, um, plans to address the level two schools. Um, we have a, a much deeper implementation of data teams. Um, I believe the committee is aware that we now have um, data teams, particularly at the elementary schools that are meeting on a regular basis. Um, data teams w would make it sound like that there's just one data team. And what I, what I should say is that um, we have building subs that rotate from each of the elementary schools so that they can cover the classrooms. They're all certified teachers um, and those while they're covering, say, first grade, first grade is in with the principal looking at the data for um, an hour every seven days. So they're looking at not only their MCAS data, but they're also looking at how are the DRA scores for the fall, how are the writing scores for the fall, how are the uh, initial math scores for the fall, um, what are the students that need interventions, are those interventions working, we come back and revisit that. Um, every eight weeks to see if the, those interventions are working. So that's um, a much deeper implementation than we have had in the past. We're now including math and writing in the review of these data teams. Originally, they just looked at reading and reading intervention. We're formalizing the tracking of RTI, which is response to intervention results. So if we do a, a, something for a student, we, are we actually getting some response for that intervention? Um, we have a regular data team and curriculum focus team meetings using those rotating subs as I talked about. So um, while some of the time may be looking at the data, other times maybe the fourth grade is gonna start a new unit on um, some type of writing and they would meet together and talk about what they were gonna do and how they were gonna assess it and what would be the formative assessment as they go through this unit. Uh, we have the, our student, our baseline edge student analytics system um, that allows those data teams to more quickly analyze the data and drill down and document interventions and track success of interventions as well as we're um, increasing the use of uh, Edwin analytics that comes from the state, which is a state uh, data analysis tool. We're increasing the use of formative assessment. Um, we're continuing to use either what's called the flex blocks in some schools or the win block, what I need block. We have literacy coaches that are working um, on a much deeper level. And as I said, we increased the number of math coaches. Um, another thing that we're doing for literacy is that we've asked for volunteer teachers who want to really focus on a specific writing unit. Um, and those teachers will actually go into a um, a teacher who is sort of like a mentor teacher in that area who really knows that unit go, will go in, watch that teacher teach, and then we'll actually split up and work with little groups in that classroom, and then we'll get feedback from the literacy coaches and we'll be debriefing, and then they will meet after school, and then they also have a discussion group. So it's a very intensive professional development program um, around literacy to try to really ramp up teachers' expertise in Lucy Calkins and the Common Core as quickly as possible. Um, and finally, um, we'll be continued focus on the teacher evaluation system with specific school and teacher goals that are targeted to student achievement. Yes. I mean, what I, if, 
what I see up there, first of all, I think, you know, we should put this in context. We're, we're a level two district with a level one high school, and we're, I mean, we're a pretty high performing district. So yes, this is, that's correct. Know, so I think we should just, yes. we're having a conversation about a, a high performing district, not a district that's in a crisis. Mm -hmm. But when I see that, um, those are also things you're doing at level one schools, right? I mean, there's no, the work. Oh, that, yeah. right. But yes, we, but the level two schools do not share a math coach, and the level one schools will share a math oh, coach. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's a distinction. Um, the level two schools, a couple, two of them, Pierce and Thompson, are also title one schools, particularly Thompson. Yeah. So they get additional services based on the title one uh, entitlement grant. That you would not get at a, um, a non-Title One school. Do you, um, in a Level Two school, uh, are, are you are you trying to find ways to to give teachers more uh, time to um, I don't know more time for coaching and and, and, and support of their practice? Uh -huh. uh, yes, um, that's the, the the professional development I just described. Okay, so that's, the, that's across that, that's the more, district. But that's but more time than a level one district, level one uh, school. They get more coaching time from the math coach in a level, and two, a level school. two school. Yes. Okay, so it's actually a good thing to be in a level two school as a kind of a <laughs> emerging teacher, right? You get more support and practice as you build your practice. Well, our our new teachers get also that kind of support anyway is part of our mentoring program. They right. have the math mentoring program, the reading mentoring program. What, what Laura is describing is actually really more targeted for our, for our teachers with professional status. Yeah, yeah. Right. okay. Because that, they don't necessarily have those clinical models that we've embedded for our pre-professional teachers. Right. But one of the things that's not an, un, un, it's a really an important initiative this year that we're talking about is that a lot of schools have been doing data teams, but one of the impediments have been that um, sub, sub coverage is unreliable. Mm -hmm. um, you, you call for a sub and then you don't get enough subs that day, so you, you have to cancel your data team. Because the bill goes to the district so they pay more. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've done this year is we've actually is. hired a team that oh, wow. is a team uh, that goes around, and we mentioned that, but it's really important to understand how important that is because then it's a reliable time. When they go to a particular school, the principal can mm -hmm. have two-hour blocks, three-hour blocks. They, there's a lot of discretion mm -hmm. how they use, the, they cover this. But it also provides a lot of um, common planning time, too, around mm -hmm. the data and around planning, which honestly has been something that teachers want more of but mm -hmm. the day just doesn't necessarily provide. Yeah, no, it's, it's the, and, and as to the largest extent possible, this team of subs will be assigned to the same classrooms over and over mm -hmm. again, so they really get to know the students and where they are and the curriculum, and so um, they're already establishing relationships with the students in the building, because they've already been in most buildings at least twice. Real quick, yeah. are these people being paid substitute pays, pay, or are they being paid uh, more of a, like a permanent sub? So they're being paid um, like a permanent sub plus a little bit. They're being paid okay. at the level of a, a BSP in okay. the district. The, okay. I can attest that, in the, as Mr. Thielman mm -hmm. said, in other school districts, there are times when I will be subbing with a team and I will go through four different classes during the day, and that's exactly what those teachers are doing. They're meeting at a, at a grade level for data team meetings uh, and like that. And uh, what you're doing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they... I get usually the same classes each time, so that relationship is formed. Did you have a question? Oh yeah, I just had a question about teacher buy-in, because I know that this is um, not brand new, but, but five years ago teachers weren't doing this kind of analytical um, data, sort of delving into things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about, um, is this something teachers are excited about? Is there a lot of buy-in? Is there you know, controversy, just... Well, they've been having um, data team meetings regarding reading for probably since 2007. That's when mm -hmm. we had the big push on literacy within the district. Um, so that was already established, and now we're adding math and um, writing on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the time that we're giving teachers, I think they feel comfortable that they now have the time. In addition, we have a, a math coach that's also a data specialist who used to work with DSAC for the mm -hmm. state. So she's going into the buildings and she's working with teams. She provided the same training, um, has been providing training and will be providing ongoing training to all the um, reading teachers, to all the math coaches, 
to all the principals and assistant principals and deans so that we're really um, raising the capacity for folks to help facilitate these discussions. Um, and I know already on our professional development day um, on, in November, she's also gonna be running some workshops that people can sign up for for even more. And eventually we'll be running after school, a, a series of after school trainings for teachers on the analytical tools that we have. So mm -hmm. the teachers will as much as support as they feel like they need, because I really think that's the key. We want people to get mm -hmm. um, comfortable with looking at the data and feel like they have the support and we just don't have them out there mm -hmm. right. sort of hanging. So um, we have we provided a lot of support for them. Okay, uh, I, I just want to put some perspective here. Uh, every year it gets harder and harder to be a level one school. I think there was a drop from about 32% of the schools statewide to about 26. And we actually gained. We, we, we now have uh, four out of nine schools level one, so that's 44%. Where uh, the, the percentage of our schools that are level <coughs> one are greater than the state. Um, it, 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 the, the reason why is that the target on the CPI increases every year, and, it, and the target is designed to get more and more difficult. Um, our overall results have improved. Uh, certainly for our all, or all our students, mm -hmm. you, you can see that the district as a whole is above 75, and 75 is the threshold. 75 is the criteria for uh, for um, uh, gaining 100 points in the PPI system, and, and that's the target. Uh, we did have some declines among high-need students, and that's one thing that we're going to need to address. But overall, I mean, when, when you take a look at the growth scores across the district, we've got a, a couple of places where we have issues. Uh, the movement of the high school into a level one status is a significant improvement. Uh, there, there are pluses and minuses in any school district's report at this time, but I think that we've got more pluses this year than, than, than minuses. Uh, but it, it really is a complicated thing to explain because it operates on three different levels. There are three different criteria in terms of determining school levels, and, and it's, uh, it's not easy to, to, to sort out. Thank you, Dr. Chesson. Thank you. Look forward to the part two. <laughs> two weeks. Okay. Oh, you need it. Okay. We're now on to uh, monthly financial report. Ms. Johnson. Um, good evening. I'm sorry I was late. There was a capital budget meeting. Um, and now I know where the chairman of the capital budget committee went when he left the meeting early. <laughs> <laughs> I met him on the stairs on my way out. Um, there, there isn't really much to report in terms of change from last month. We are still, um, I have to say, while I really like this paperless system, in some ways it's a little, a little more difficult. There we go. There we go. No, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry for the delay. Um, that we're pretty much in the same place that I reported last month. As I said before, we are projecting to be over budget that is well within the re reach of coverage from our reserves because of additional positions we needed um, to, to do the staffing based on our summer enrollment, um, our summer enrollment projections. Um, the, this month we've included the grant reports. The grants were not fully set up at the time that the reports mm -hmm. came out. So in some of the grants, when you look at them, you see expenses but not budget. That's just a matter of things churning through, getting set up, and they should be fine by next month. Um, any questions on the current fiscal year? Okay. Um, the other part of my presentation today is about the, yay, um, last fiscal year. As we reported last year, we expected to be, we were over budget. Um, we requested and received a, the $500,000 reserve that had been put aside on our behalf by town meeting um, for special education um, overage, and we took that back from the town, and that really went a long way. When we initially were projecting the deficit last year, I think my initial projection was around 1.2 million, and I really need to give a shout out to the special ed department for really doing a lot of hard work in the spring to try to slow that trend. So we ended up ending 
in a better place than I anticipated. Um, we ended up $838,000 above budget, 500 of which was covered by that reserve from the town. So we didn't have to dip into our own reserves very heavily to complete the fiscal year, which is good news. Um, mm -hmm. There were no real surprises, and I did give you the detail um, in the packet to look at. You know, the, the principal areas were out of district tuition, um, one to one assistance, medical services, and behavioral supports, all of which we discussed in prior meetings. So I didn't find anything in the final numbers that was really off track from everything we had seen the whole year. I was able to use um, the FY14 final numbers and compare them to FY11, 12, 13 final numbers and the FY15 working budget right now, which has incorporated the staffing changes that we've been discussing. And just a couple of um, thoughts on the trends. Um, special education seems to be quite uniformly about a third of budget. Um, even though our budget's grown substantially over these five years, special ed is keeping pace. Um, I'm going to show you that slide. Um, that's, that's in absolute dollars. Um, the red is special ed, the blue, everything else. But that's when you make it 100% of budget, you can see that as a percentage of budget, it is right there that we are not seeing a lot of flutter from year to year, which I found very interesting. I don't know if that means anything. I just found it interesting. Um, the other new metric that I brought in this year is that teaching. We see that teaching as a percentage of total budget is creeping up. In this, in this slide, the blue is the investment in teaching. The red is the investment in teaching assistance, and the green is everything else. So teaching has grown from 47% of budget in FY11 to 51% of budget in FY15. When you say everything else, those things that support the teachers in the classroom? Everything else that's in our operating budget. Thank you. So basically, I'm just backing out no, the, no. Big, the big pieces. Um, and I think that's very interesting because of the educational research indicates that high quality teachers have the biggest bang for you know, improvement in our test scores and we now have a level one high school. So I think it would look like that the financial investment is bearing some fruit for us. Isn't that also tracking their increased enrollment? Yes. That too. You know, we, we're certainly, we're certainly trying to, um, you know, we're certainly trying to keep class sizes reasonable and, you know, obviously that's a key driver, but I think it's more than that. It's, I think it's beyond just keeping pace with enrollment growth. I think, you know, the investments that you've heard about in math coaches and literacy coaches are not new. The math coaches are new, but the investment in the special ed um, related service providers at the elementary school to create teams, the, the new investment in um, substitute support to allow the teams to meet and really delve into data. I mean, those are all people intensive as opposed to thing intensive. People are very expensive and of course they grow and grow and grow with every contract cycle, but that is, seems to be where you get the results. So, you know, if somebody could invent a piece of software that could replace all of that, that wouldn't get a contract increase every year, that would be nifty, but so far they haven't. So um, I, think, I think where we're putting our money is paying off well for us. And we're doing it quite modestly. We're still below the average in the state for per pupil expenditures. So we're getting great results on a shoestring. I think, I think as a district, we need to be really proud of how we're doing that. And that's it. Questions? Congratulations, free one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Um, we're now diversity hiring report, Mr. Spiegel. Yes, yeah, so you have that in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. And you do have the reports, the comparisons from previous years in terms of previous hires that are still here, mm -hmm. new hires in 2000, uh, you know, this year. Um, and that is this year since October 1 of last year mm -hmm. to um, September 30th, basically, of, uh, or, um, of, or mid-September of this year, um, of who the new hires are and what they reported. Um, you, we do have, I mean, we do still <coughs> struggle like other districts do, and I've talked to other districts about the struggle to really diversify our staffs the way we would really like to. We've done well in certain areas um, in terms of getting some diversity. I think in some of our teaching assistant hires, 
at some of the schools, they've uh, some of the, they've done very well in increasing the diversity among the staff. I will say that our after-school programs, the district-run after-school programs through the Arlington after-school programs, have done pretty well in diversifying their staff. Um, we still have a ways to go in some of the classroom teachers in the district in um, getting uh, you know people of color into the classrooms, and it's an ongoing effort. We're increasingly um, stressing the importance of this to the principals and curriculum directors, and you know they're buying into it. We still do suffer, uh, like a lot of districts do, in some for some openings with the pool of candidates of color is very small in the state and in some of the for some of the positions we are hiring for. I mean, for example, we had you know a few elementary positions that we hired for this year, ele elementary classroom teachers. <clears throat> we received over 300 applications on school spring. A very, very small percentage were identified on school spring as people of color. Um, and so that's that's a challenge there in in the state and um, and we have we're we do want to bring people in who are qualified applicants to interview, um, but th it's a it's a challenge that we face and that other other districts face as well. Um, we do also, in terms of our total numbers and you know our total numbers of black employees who are identified as black or African American has not really, it's gone up a little bit, but not much, and there was some, you know, in some turnover because as we've had, the hires are usually, have been in teaching assistant positions or other um, positions that are not classroom teachers, there tends to be more turnover of teaching assistants. Um, teaching assistants throughout, in all of Arlington schools, tend to move on um, from the teaching assistant role into teacher roles, whether here or in other um, districts. And some of the people who, um, who we hired last year left for other districts this year. So I mean, that's, you know, that's one issue where we're not gaining as much as we would like and sort of staying uh, basically steady. And we also have a lot of people who don't self-identify and the numbers are, there are a little confusing. I think what we've done, the reason there seems to be more now than in previous years is we've captured in the data more of the people who did not self-identify. I think we were looking, had to look in more than one place in our MUNIS system to find, you know, if, to find um, that category of, of people. So there's still, it's a voluntary thing. We do not force people to identify their um, racial or ethnic identity, but um, most choose to do so. But again, it's voluntary. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. Um, one is, shouldn't there be a category of sort of multi-ethnic, multi-race? Because it's, people don't always neatly fit into right. categories. Um, and then the second question is, um, it's hard to get a picture from this of um, how many people of color are have direct contact with students versus um, somebody who's hired in the district has less contact with students, and I'd just okay. be great to get a sense of. So, um, the, we don't, we have not moved to that that checkoff box basically mm -hmm. on our form for the multiracial and I, uh, multi race category, and I think that's something we need to look into for the future. For the people who don't have much, it's hard to say. It's you'd be surprised at how many, whether they're classroom teachers or teaching assistants. There's a lot of people who do have are in the schools, we have our IT people are in the schools. Our, our IT department is a diverse department mm -hmm. with um, Asian American, um, uh, African American, mm -hmm. uh, white employees. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, and it's not a big department either. Right. So it's a, it's a pretty, there's some diversity there. And those employees are in the schools. So They're kids in classrooms see helping kids see a them variety all the okay. time. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's the goal, right? Cafeteria to have workers. Mm -hmm. are, you know, there's some mm -hmm. diversity there. Kids see them I mean, mm -hmm. in the cafeteria, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, teaching assistants are in the classroom. They're in the schools. They're helping out. So kids see them. Mm -hmm. I think where, you, where we do lack, and I'll, uh, you know, I think it's, it's fair, especially um, in, in the black or African-American uh, people who identify as black or African American, we don't have a very, very many people who are classroom teachers or AEA unit A members. So we want to increase that. Ms. Stocks? What? I'm just going down the line. 
for questions. Nope. Mr. Pierce. Quick question on that. Um, how are we doing in terms of the recruiting, like being proactive about going to uh, traditionally black colleges or writing those letters? So we've written the letters in the past few years to the traditionally black colleges. The Superintendent's Diversity Advisory Committee has, has sent letters themselves mm -hmm. to um, places of worship that are primarily in um, communities of color. Uh, and those have those yielded some results. I don't think we've gotten a, a lot of results from there. We have not gone. We haven't sort of put the expense into making a trip down to, I know some of the historically black colleges have job fairs. Um, that might be something to think about. Um, that's an expense, but it would be something that could um, potentially yield results mm -hmm. in the future. Um, so we have been proactive in reaching out. We've um, maintained our, you know, obviously we've maintained our membership in the MESS, the MPDE, the Partnership for Diversity in, in Education. And again, I mean, in our, we met a few weeks ago, most of, the, a lot of the districts are having similar issues, um, even in the MPDE of, of attracting and, and retaining and, and hiring the, uh, the candidates that we want. Um, and, um, you know, there's always things to do. There's always that more that we can do. Um, and I think a lot is, you know, the state, uh, we, we need to really um, in, interact more with the colleges, mm. the, the education prep programs here, the educator prep programs in Massachusetts. I think those, all of those programs are also, um, have a responsibility as well, and I think have an interest in attracting and retaining qualified students of color who can become teachers in the, mm in the in Massachusetts mm -hmm. thank you just go um, I just wanted to for our viewing and audience at home who don't have the report in front of them um, I appreciate that we do want to continue to increase but I wanted to point out that the total number of um, teachers of diverse backgrounds this year is 66 that's up from a total of 61 last year and 42 in 2012 um, the percentage is down a little bit this year compared to last year uh, just because we've got so many more teachers yeah. and other employees but still I think that is impressive and even make in the um, difficult environment that you're talking about I think that making any strides forward is good Thank you. So we've, we've, we've made some strides, and we've been tracking this data since 2009. Maybe we've been tracking it longer, but we have the data since 2009. And there's, there's, been, some, there's been some improvement. But I'm wondering if, if, it's a, if there's a, we should think a little bit differently about this. And I'm wondering, you know, we have the same problem as all the districts in our region. In all the districts. Sure. I mean, we're, we're, so I'm wondering if there are conversations between the districts about this issue and if there are ways to combine forces to try, try to recoup more people of color to, to, to all the suburban districts. Yeah. There are. I mean, there are conversations constantly among our, the, our groups. I mean, there's multiple groups involved. There's the, mm -hmm. the MPDE, which is the group that we belong to. Mm -hmm. um, there's another HR group with some of the um, some of the suburban districts that are no, no longer in MPDE have joined together to form a consortium, and they it, we focused on this issue of recruiting applicants of color. They kind of they have a job fair as well. The um, MASPA group, the HR directors throughout the state, talk about this constantly. We talk about you know regularly at our meetings. We with people from the state, from the Office of Professional Licensure, to talk about uh, you know how that's a bigger topic that the state is undergoing now anyway on licensure and whether, um, especially if we want to recruit people from other states who may be licensed in another state, how do they get licensed in Massachusetts? There are some challenges for people to do that. So uh, there are lots of conversations going on among our group and many other groups. Yeah, because I mean, what I've learned over the years in recruiting is if you want to recruit anybody really, you got to go to them. Yes. You know, and so it doesn't make, I don't, I'm not sure it's, it makes good sense for Arlington to think about um, you know, making our own trip to the traditionally black colleges and, and universities. It, it, but if we were to combine mm -hmm. with other districts, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I don't know. I, I haven't, you know, I've just thrown out the idea. But, but with a bunch of districts and there was a sharing of expenses or someone, someone went to some of these colleges 
and represented a, a, a multiple districts, that might be a better approach. Because you can't, yeah. you know, I've just, you, you really, unless you go, you gotta go there to, to find this talent. You gotta actually go there, go on campus, talk to people, build relationships mm -hmm. to find the kind of talent you want. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it's expensive to do it as one sole, one-off district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's practical. Hmm. No. I would like to see in the report um, as far as TAs and classroom teachers. Okay. I appreciate the other, the other exposure, but I, I think that's part of the main goal. The other thing I'd like to ask uh, is to have a <coughs> response from the uh, principals of why they didn't hire anybody. I mean, it doesn't have to be in a diversity. Just to get an idea if they're, if they're what's going on. Uh, this is one area, uh, we don't, we have a very small pool, but you did indicate there were some. We weren't successful for whatever reason, maybe the salary wasn't there or the benefits and things of that nature. If it comes down to that, that's fine. But just feedback to you sure. uh, of why people aren't being hired across the pool. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Mr. Spiegel. You're welcome, thank you. Um, we are now into superintendent's report. Dr. Bodie. Well, it's not, it's not a very long report this evening. Um, what you had in your materials were two charts that you're very familiar with. One chart says the October 2014, and the other one says October 8th. The one that's October 2014 um, was the snapshot on October 1. Now, I'm going to be talking about some numbers and tonight, but one of the things I do want to caution you or to, to explain to you is that th these numbers ha still have to be certified by the state. So even though you can see this snapshot of what we had in, in different classrooms in the elementary and, and the total numbers in the high school and the middle school, uh, there's a, a certification process that will go on. So we probably won't have the certified number, which is the number that the state uses to determine Chapter 70 money, and the number that we in Arlington use to determine what the uh, increase for enrollment number will be. All right, so I think that it's going to be very close to this number. It's, it's not going to waver very much because we did a considerable amount of reconciling numbers over the last month. In fact, almost on a daily basis, we're always comparing class lists to what we had in power school. But um, what, you will, what you will see, um, the number that we have as a total increase when we look at preschool, we look at out of district, we look at all of them, is we're gonna be over 200. Right now, the number we have is about 213. Um, but it could, as I said, it could waver a little bit. But that gives you the magnitude of what the increase was this year. And you compare that to what it was over the previous two years. In the previous two years, we had an increase of 280 students. So we are now, over after three years, getting very close to an increase in the school district of nearly 500. We're not there yet, but nearly so. We have an elementary school, which will at some point this year probably tip over 500. It's been over 500, under 500, as we've had students enter and leave. Um, but we are definitely seeing um, a very big increase. And if you look at the other chart that I provided you um, at your request, it's in your, it's in your packet, it gives you an idea of what the increases have been at different grade levels in different schools. And I think that you can see that it's not just a kindergarten phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It is really something that is across the board um, at different, in different schools. So that gives you a, a, some idea in terms of what, what the kind of um, uh, changes have yep. been. So what will happen once we get the certified number, which will not probably happen until late in October, um, at that point, um, Ms. Johnson is going to use that number to do um, a projection in terms of what, what the next few years will be. But one of the things we're also doing is looking at uh, different ways to perhaps look at that. 
Right, right now, um, the way that, you, you might want to say a couple of words about the way that you do it right now, and uh, another aspect of this might be that we will in, introduce some other databases that might give us some other ideas of what to expect. So, Diane, you might want to explain that. The way I've been um, doing the enrollment projections um, since I started here is based on a, a three-year weighted average that looks at how many children move from, say, first grade to second grade. And so five years ago um, is five times less important than last year. Mm -hmm. And so I create a number, and then I apply that to the number of students, and then I shoot that forward five years. To get the kindergarten numbers, I take the live births from five years previously, as far as I have them, the fifth year out, obviously they're not all born yet. Um, but I estimate that based on the way it looks. Um, I have to say that what I've seen in the preliminary work on this, our number of live births in town is going up, and that while in general over the last five years, the rate of live births to children in kindergarten has been 85, 87%, um, we're almost at 100% for this year. And so if, in fact, all the kids, not 85% of the kids' live births in town show up in kindergarten, if all of them do, plus the fact that we see that we're having more babies in town for sure, um, you know, I think it's going to continue. This year I'm also going to present it not just with the five-year weighted average but with a five-year straight average. These two metrics were used by my mentor in Cambridge for many years to um, try to guess at what enrollment was going to look like, but it is a guess. Um, selectman Dan Dunn worked with me last spring, or actually he did the work and I watched um, because it was way out of my league, um, to really try to do the over-under on how good these numbers were and there's a pretty significant swing up or down. Uh, I mean, and the truth of the matter is, as he said, in long-range planning, it's really hard to predict the future. Okay. So, you know, ideally, I, I mean, in capital budget it came up tonight, one of the People said we should go out and hire a consultant who can do a study and tell us how many kids we're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. If I thought there was somebody out there that we could buy that could wow. tell us, I'd they be just happy. Give us the money and take our number. So you know, I, I don't I don't have I don't have any emotional investment in this metric of how I predict it. It's better than nothing, but as we know, last year it was way off. I mean, I was predicting mathematically we'd be up about 80 kids, and we're way we're more than double that. So. You know, is it better than nothing? Maybe not. I mean, certainly we'll talk to some other towns. Certainly we'll try to see what we can do to come up with some other way to predict this. But I think the thing, you know, NESDAQ and MSBA use metrics really based on women of childbearing age, which I think falls down in this district because I think we're going through a cultural change mm -hmm. where older families are moving out and younger <laughs> families are moving in. And mm -hmm. I just don't have any, I mean, I'm just, I, I, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to guess that. Um, Mr. Schlickman. I'm just looking at the numbers and, and the comparison chart. I wish they went past grade five, that, that two-year yeah. chart. But what I'm seeing is, is the cohorts themselves are fairly stable. Yeah. For example, last year's kindergarten was 471. For this year's first grade is 479. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's you know some erosion. I mean, we went from 428 in our fourth grade last year to 423 in their fifth grade this year. So. That's not, at least at that part of the puzzle isn't difficult. The real, real difficult thing was, was predicting that kindergarten number, which went up from 471 to 508 this year. Right. Uh, and, and that's the kicker. I think what's happening, you know, you're right in terms of the real estate thing, but I think that what's happened is, is that <coughs> people who are having children now don't want the two acres out on the other side of 495. They want to be in, they're much more willing to live in smaller space to live in a community such as this. And that, I think, is the dynamic. We've become a very attractive family community, and people are willing to live in smaller spaces to enjoy the amenities in this town. Which is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, obviously we're offering a great product here. Um, but it, it brings its challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we think? How do we think rationally about space needs, building needs, the future? How do we guess in you know five to ten years in the long range plan? Twenty years from now, what do we need for school space? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. We, yeah. we cannot. We cannot afford the school population of fifty years ago that this town had. Yeah. Because we are offering so many diverse programs that require more staff and more more spaces and stuff. We also don't have all the buildings. Yeah. that we had and I'm not looking back on that yeah. but 
I've said it before, two families my age moved out down the street from me, two families moved in, one had two, one had three, they're all going to Hardy this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's becoming, as Mr. Schlickman said, more and more prevalent. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nippy. Um, <coughs> I'm also looking at the mm -hmm. comparison chart, um, as Mr. Schlickman said. Um, what I would like to see it follow cohorts, as, as mm -hmm. he said, but I'd also like to see both the ins and the outs, so how many students left that cohort and how many gained just oh, to get it you know I don't want just the yeah. total I want to know how much in and out so I have an idea of the churn it's it's churn we've had that earlier I think right but not this mm -hmm. one right? I, yeah I, in I other words the class of 2022 ones. had this number of kids last yeah. year and X number of kids left and X number of kids came in yeah that's yeah, right that's now that's not just, data I've ever given you before yeah, yeah. I, I, I yeah. You've, yeah. you've never had that data. What you see here, the, the churn in terms of a, a, a final resolved number. Mm -hmm. No, like that's, not, like that's not the churn, that's just the total. Yeah. Um, that's the end result. And when I, I want the churn. I want to have some idea of what the churn is. That would take, I that's think, very a difficult. That, 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 wouldn't amount be, of that wouldn't be easy to do. No, it would, it would be not. very difficult. Very, very difficult mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, and, and I'm not really sure what it tells you. Mm -hmm. I think it gives you, it, there's a big difference in trying to predict the future if you have 50 students and each year 10 are leaving and 11 are coming back in. And then all of a sudden, the number who are leaving drops a bunch. So all of a sudden, your numbers are going to start spouting up instead of going up by one. But I, think it, it, I think it's something that, I think it is something that we need to be tracking. Mm -hmm. And I think it is something that factors into, it, it gives you an idea of how much um, change there is going on. And mm -hmm. we know right now that there's a change, come that the net change is coming in, mm -hmm. but. Well, the it, continuity uh, rate captures, mm -hmm. you know, it, that in many of the grades, it's greater than 100%. We're seeing growth at multiple grades. We're not just seeing growth in kindergarten and first grade. We're seeing growth in second, third, fifth, high school. We're seeing growth all through. It does capture that. But I'm not sure the comings and goings of bodies, which is going to be phenomenally difficult to get a handle on, you know, I. I I think, the, I think it's the overall numbers that are important. I, I but each, each school, as soon as a student leaves, the, school, the building itself knows that student's left. When a student comes into the building, that building knows a student has yeah. come in. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting it's, it's going to show up in a report automatically, but we've had discussions about certain levels of keeping records. But we are required to uh, take in new records. We're required to send out old records. Mm -hmm. There's a plus and a minus right there. That, that's done on a regular basis in the school. Yeah, but to, ca to capture that, for, to put it together with report, these are little singleton things that are happening in your data system in which you're it, recording an exit or recording an entrance. But the, those systems are designed to give you counts. Uh, and you probably don't have a, a plus minus but calculation the, the coming of a, out of at it. At the end of a school year, uh, someone in that building, it, it, you've kept a tally of negative and a tally of positive. You, probably not. I'm probably saying not. you can. Oh, I mean, you could. I mean, yeah. I, I could tell you how to, t uh, to take two exports out of the system and do what you said, but it would be a labor-intensive thing because what you would end up doing is matching uh, local IDs against kids for two years and then counting the kids who weren't in Paul, both reports. Paul, all I'm suggesting is a little slip of pa paper, minus, plus, bing, bing, and every five you do it at the end of the year. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting it be put in a piece of software. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly can inquire, but quite honestly, I want to put all of our efforts in the district to having accurate data. Mm -hmm. What I think is most important is to see the I think it's interesting to see these trends in terms of up and down, but if you had a profile sheet next month, it looked different. Yeah. It looked different than last year at each one of these grades. Um, I'm not sure that it really helps advance the thinking in terms of the important mm -hmm. things we need to look at in the district, which are, mm. if we are looking at this kind of trend of a range of 150 to 200 students increasing over the next few years. Now, I, I think we need to look at it in terms of element, all the different levels. We're, we've already begun, we began this last year, is really looking at our space issues. Um, this is going to be a significant mm -hmm. 
significant challenge to us on top of all the other things that are, uh, uh, you know, that are looking out there financially um, in the town. We, and there are going to be some hard decisions that are going to need, need to be made. How do we move students uh, from schools that are maybe growing faster than other schools and move students to where there is space? Right now we have one tool, which is buffer zones, but it has its limitations. And if you have a school, for example, Stratton, which you know, we could create additional classrooms up there, but that's not where the growth is. The growth is at Thompson and Hardy. And, and not to mention Dallin and Brackett. Dallin and Brackett are, are, so you are very <laughs> high growth. What? You renovate Stratton, it could draw more families. <laughs> well, I don't think renovating a school draws yeah. more so families. <laughs> and and you, you have to think about these things because if you want to just create the space where the kids are coming, is that an efficient use of town resources? So there are a lot of issues, and we're going to be having to accelerate that thinking and those discussions over the next year in preparing. Just, just the more, um, the most pressing one actually will be at Audison, not next year, but the following year. In fact, I had a meeting today about this very issue, um, among ma many issues, but this was a very important one. Is we really do have to know what the where, what the plan will be in terms of space next year, and I've set a deadline of uh, be, um, by December 1, actually, so we can really get a look at this in terms of the budget. But the year after, when these classes start coming into Audison, um, what size class, what class size are we gonna tolerate and where would we put them? And what, how is that gonna be configured in an already existing building, which is mm -hmm. pretty close to being maxed out right now. Yes. So I've actually received, as the chair of the facility subcommittee, which hasn't met yet, uh, we've uh, I've actually received some inquiries from from parents who uh, see these numbers and get uh, get all alarmed because mm -hmm. they're you know at Bracket and Dallin actually because they're, the the right. has gotten it's a, you know one parent said to me I don't remember the numbers ten years ago, but um, that, that the bracket has a hundred more students in it than it had ten years ago. Maybe that's mm -hmm. true. And the, right. and the, and so, so, the, so there's a there's a there's a desire on the part of some people to have a conversation uh, about the process that we're going to use to develop a, st a strategy around yes. space. Yeah. And so, there's a few people who want my subcommittee to meet to talk about this. <laughs> I would like your subcommittee. So okay. So th then this. I have a reason to. Okay. So the, the, great. So I'll I'll figure out who's on it and then we'll get together. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Ms. Fitzgerald can help you with that. No, I, I know. I think I, I'm just kidding. Mr. Pierce. A couple quick things. Um, in, in looking at the monthly enrollment as of 10 14 I'm looking just broadly at the numbers across. And, you know, I'm feeling comfortable to say, hopefully, that the, the, the added tool in the toolbox, the um, redistricting and the buffer zones, is looking like it's leveling. So certain grades that have more students are getting that extra classroom to keep mm -hmm. the numbers even. And so I want to you know, commend and congratulate the administration for doing that because I think that was one of our hopes mm -hmm. in terms of equity across it's the district. It's helping a lot. And we, we have a report coming, what, next meeting, right? Because that's the second meeting on October per our policy about how it's been going this year with the redistricting efforts, mm -hmm. what, pitfall, what pitfalls, what advances you see. Uh, and, and I look forward to hearing that at, at the next meeting. The one thing else I wanted to point out and ask about was with regard to that interesting up and down chart, at the totals at the bottom, um, so first grade last year was 472, which would translate into second grade this year at 458, right? So you, would, you wouldn't go grade to grade, they're, they're not the same. No, you, you're right. going diagonal. So, yeah, yeah. so they're going down, right? Did we touch on this yet? No. no. So, do we have any sort of reason that that might be happening? And it's pretty consistent from one to two to two to three. It's going yeah. down. Yeah, mm -hmm. they drop. It, it, and there's a, it'll be a much bigger yeah. drop between fifth and sixth. Mm -hmm. Historic? And again. Mm -hmm. Not this year. Meaning like this happens every year? Mm -hmm. Not well, this year. Fifth and sixth, certainly. We, mm -hmm. But, but I'm saying right? it's in the elementary grades. Yeah. 
I see increases. Just, not, yeah. Not, 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 not in a cohort effect. No, no, not, not in a, not cohort. a cohort. If you start, if you look at a group in kindergarten, mm -hmm. by the time they get to high school, we have we have lost a, a pretty good percentage you of get a, yes, You get a big drop right. going into the sixth. Mm -hmm. Getting into the ninth, you get a bit of a kick up, which is Sometimes. interesting. No, yeah. you also yeah, lose uh, to Minuteman. But, but, but just hear me out. From first to second goes from 472 to 458. Right. From, from third to fourth goes from 458 to 449. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and where are you looking from? Totals. Yeah. At the very bottom with the up and down arrows? In other words, the third grade from in 10, 13 to last 10, year to the fourth grade this year. Now, is this, no, this is not capturing out of district placements, nor is it capturing SLCs. But, but it's, no, it's, it's, it's dealing with so. the buildings that we have in the house. Our classrooms. It's just These are our classrooms, classrooms in house. Right. Not necessarily. I mean, you could have had students in one year who are now out of district. But they're, they're not, not that many. I, I hope there aren't that many going out of Probably district. Not that many. We'd be <laughs> broke. But so that could be one of the reasons there for this. There are muddying factors. Right. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the factors are, what we place this on. It seems to be pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. um, do we have exit interviews for people leaving the what? district? Like, are, are you moving out of town? Are you sending to another school? I mean, is that possible to just inquire? Silence. Crickets. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's, I, I, I found it interesting. I, I would support it's that. scary. I mean, I, if it's just a matter of being, my father and my grandfather all went to this private school, that's one thing. If there's an issue with the programs that they're going into, I think we need to know that. It wouldn't I, hurt. I think sometimes people move for bigger spaces. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean their houses I mean, bigger and but, they need yeah. a bigger space. Yeah. Right. There, there are very, right now, if the, uh, in three years time, uh, the top, uh, I guess, third, fourth, and fifth, when they uh, all hit the middle school, that will be a total, if they all go. Which they be, don't. They I, I'm do. just saying, though, okay, if they all right. went, there's 234 plus right. right there. Right. If 234 don't go, right. that's an awful, that, that would just break even if 234 didn't go. That's a, mm. something we need to find out on that exit interview or something. But that's just, no, that's a natural break. A lot of people send their kids to private schools for the upper classes. It's usually about 10%. Yeah, Is it yeah. we lose, we lose a good chunk. Every year. That, just that fifth, yeah. the sixth, and eighth to ninth are huge for eighth a lot to ninth, of people. I I no, no, no. Fifth no, to sixth Fifth to sixth is a big one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even bigger. Okay. Yeah. Fifth to sixth is the biggest. I thought, <laughs> this year we got extra people coming in, right? This Across the board. The, 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 the jump between fifth and sixth wasn't as, we didn't lose as many this year. Is that right? Well, I, I thought that's about, about the same that. percent. Okay. okay. Uh, it, we actually had a bigger number. At the beginning of the summer, we thought we'd have 419 coming in, and that was actually a little over reduction. You should be and able to. It was to down, it was like three, it's like 397 now. Okay. But aren't, you, you, aren't we able to get data on the number of students, number of residents in the town of Arlington under the age of, you know, at, at school age, and how many are in public schools and how many are in non public schools? Mm -hmm. So we can get that data. My guess is. Over the past decade, the percentages have not changed much. Right. That'd be good to know. Yeah. It isn't then well, uh, don't we? Normal. Huh? It isn't that part of we track those people in college schools? Yeah, we, we have to. you have that data someplace. Have somebody that somebody has the data for every town, every right. city and town in the state. So you can get that data, and I bet you over a 10-year period, I don't think there's probably been much change in the percentages. In fact, if I had to guess, it's probably the private school has dropped. Not probably has because of because of prices in the in the recession. Our, our percentage of private schools has remained very steady over 10 years. Yeah, so that would yeah. be a good thing for the whole committee to see because I saw something on that about a half a decade ago and there wasn't much change. Mm -mm. Somebody brought it to the meeting and there wasn't much change. It's, it's, in, I just, the, it's in the 12 to 15%. Yeah, there has not been much change. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a small question. Um, so I was looking um, at your 8-1 numbers and then I was looking, actually I didn't do the analysis for um, October 1st, but the 9-18 numbers. And most schools, what you thought you were going to get an 8-1 um, on August 1st, the numbers dropped. Right. Big exception being Thompson fifth grade. Well, but, um, but I'm just wondering, do we know why? I mean, so I know my daughter knew about some kids who she knew weren't coming back, but they weren't officially reflected as not coming back. So I'm wondering, is there? Yes. Well, we're trying to improve that. So what can happen is we were late this year in, in rolling over promotions. Our, the way PowerSchool works, 
Um, we're maybe getting way too in the weeds, mm. but <laughs> power school works where you have to create your master schedule before you promote. Not all data systems are like that. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that unless your master schedule, you, you don't pr do promotions until that happens. So we have to look at ways that we can better utilize how we remove students from the system um, during this period of time. We didn't promote until early August. And then additionally, there's also a need to keep students that were in the district last year in power school, sort of in an active, an active um, designation for this, the summer reports. So there are a lot of things going on, but we're working on this so that doesn't happen as mm -hmm. much. So it's a question of whether, th th you're absolutely right, the schools may know that these students are on, their, on the list, but they may not have reconciled them with what is actually appearing in power school, mm -hmm. and that's something we have to really work on better, getting better at. So that's really where more of the discrepancies are, is it's just the comparison between what's on the school list versus what's in power school. Okay, but then you have more accurate numbers, or you don't, do you just have what's on power school? When we're, you're deciding, say, to add a teacher or not to add a teacher? Well, that, was, that was actually the part that was very, you know, in, before we've had these big increases, the, in, the need for accuracy, there was a margin where you could operate in, because it wasn't that big a change. But when you have these massive changes every year, and then most of them is happening in the summer, it is extremely important to have accurate numbers. So that is the big push this year in terms of our data, to get, to get the system in place where we have a way to actively reconcile throughout the summer, even though we have this constraint of promotions and even though we had this constraint of keeping last year's data alive. And we're working on how to do that. Yes. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Judd said about the uh, class sizes, and I agree that in general they look very good. Um, my concern, though, is with Thompson in right. grades four and five. Exactly. Um, and my understanding is that the kids in grade, and I remember for grade five that last year they were high in grade four, and, and for grade three they were, for grade four they were high in grade three last year. And I'm just concerned that we've again created a small cohort which is going through a good chunk of their schooling in really high classroom, high um, numbers. And I mm -hmm. am concerned about this. Well, we are too. We have um, right now a large class TA and we've just hiring a building sub which will be, we're looking at it over the next week to decide if we actually need more support but right now we're gonna have a TA at the fifth grade and the fourth grade. Oh. <coughs> oh. Full time? It's new. Pardon? Full time? Oh yeah, full time TA. In, in both That's classrooms? New, Not in each classroom, at that grade level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a half time TA. I, I'm just also concerned in the setting of the MCAS scores that we just looked at at Thompson, that this doesn't seem like a good setup. We've had, we're really looking at this. And um, in fact, I just met with the principal Thompson about that, this very issue this week. So we are, look, we're, we're, we're having a, we had one TA for both grades, which was not sustainable. But, he, but here's another issue with TAs. Even though our number of TAs are going up, we're also facing a situation, we started to see it last year with our, at our secondary level but is now into the elementary. It is very hard and we're to, we, we've had a lot of people we've hired as TAs and then have left for another position, a TA in another district because our TA salaries are too low. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're gonna have to talk about at budget time. Mm -hmm. And it's really becoming an issue this year. So even though we have in the budget for some TA positions, we've had, we've been challenged to fill them. We are very fortunate, the pe some of the people we have, because we have a lot of certified teachers and they do a fabulous job. Um, but this is, this is just like we saw the issue with sub salaries last year, we're now seeing the issue with TA salaries. And, it, and it's, it's a, in some ways it's a, actually sort of a good sign for us as a state because it means that the, the economy is improving. And so there are many more many more opportunities for people. And uh, so the pool is down 
and um, people be, with the pools down, then th there's much more of a, a, of a market for the person looking for the job. They, they have the upper hand in the situation. Yes. I just also want to say that my son was in a cohort that was 27 or 28 for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And he's going to graduate high school this fine <laughs> this year. My, yeah, but they were fine. Idea. It, I know it's not ideal, but it does work. And they did a great job at making it work. And I know that these teachers are also going to make it work. And, and I'm actually proud at the number of uh, classrooms that we have that are not that big. You know, I was actually really happy when I saw these numbers to say, wow, you know, when I look at it, there were only like, I don't know, maybe five or six out of all of these classrooms that really stood out as high. And yes, they're high, but we don't have any in the 30s. I mean, I hear of some districts where there are 35, 36 kids um, in a classroom, and we're not, we're not close to that. And, and so, you know, I know that they do look high, and, and they are high for our district, but they are, they are dealable. Um, just want to make uh, one quick comment. Uh, I think the benefit that your child had in a class that size, we had active parents involved. Class sizes of 28, the reality of public education sometimes acts as the parent that isn't at home. And teachers get really are not able to identify and deal with issues that are not supported at home sometimes as the class size gets bigger. I think 20, I think I think those other fifth grade classes are phenomenal. I think that's really great. But I think 28 in a classroom, even with in, in, you know, a full-time aid might mitigate it, but, but we're dealing with a half-time aid. And I understand budget restraints. We, we can't have everything that we want, but this is, 28 is really, really high at that age level. Yes, um, I just wanted to respond. I also had a child who was in a class size of 29 and 30 from third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade, and yes, they did okay, but they didn't have the significant high needs population that exists in Thompson. They didn't have the poor MCAS scores that we just saw this year, and to just dismiss it that the teachers work hard, I agree they work hard. We lost one of our really great fourth grade teachers the year after my daughter had the class of 30, and I'm sure that was a contributor, not the children themselves, but wouldn't you want to go to a to a district where you have a class size of 20 or 25 rather than 30? And I think it bear and it also concerns me that we have certain silos that get created where kids go in and at third grade they're in a big class and they just continue, and that's not fair compared to the kids in Dolan who have class size of 22 at that time, or in fifth grade they have 23, or Bishop has 20 and 19, and it's just we're talking parity here too, not just getting by, not just succeed, not just being okay, so. Yes, I'm not saying people should be panicking, but I do think it's something we should be looking at. It, it, is, an, it is an issue, and of course, uh, Diane had, oh, she has um, her children in Cambridge schools. It's in some districts, the only way you're gonna get parity is to assign children to where the, you know, the to space. the school in town where there's an opening. So we, we still have a high value in Arlington for neighborhood schools. But neighborhood schools come with this risk of having unevenness. I think the buffer zones have helped a bit, uh, actually more than a bit. Um, I, I will also say buffer zones exceeded my expectation in terms of time spent on it too. That's another issue. But if it if it achieves the you know the leveling a little bit more, um, that's really important. I don't disagree. I don't like to see classes 28, um, and it was it, w it maintained sort of a high number through the summer. But it's if you take that and then divide it into three classes, you're you're looking at class sizes that are significantly less than the other fifth grades in town. So I think what looking to this year, what I want to do is to make sure that they have adequate support so they can do some small group. They also have a, the, the, the Thompson's one of the schools that has the full-time um, math coach. 
We also have done some very good intervention work. In fact, um, that might be something for you might like to hear about at some point this year when we do sort of a math. Like we, we have with Matt Coleman come in. We can we can't do everything, but we can talk about certain things. But there's been some wonderful interventions that have been put in our two Title I schools, particularly at Thompson, um, in mathematics for supporting the students. So that it's, it's not as though we're ignoring it. We're really trying to put the resources that we can in, in, there. Um, We're going to be changing the rule in a minute. Go ahead. Um, so uh, just specifically about Thompson, um, and I urged this point earlier, uh, a few sessions earlier, um, partly the reason that Thompson's numbers are so high is because of new people in ha who have moved in. Mm -hmm. So last year's fourth grades at Thompson had classes of 24 and 25, for, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, high-ish, but not 28, right? Um, and just to urge that when new people move in, especially at the fifth grade level, and there's a street, a school right nearby, Hardy, that has smaller classrooms, you could gently nudge, I know you can't force them <laughs> to say, you know, walk an extra five blocks and maybe you could go to a school with, you know, smaller classrooms. But Hardy's number, well, first of all, the decision on Hardy didn't come until later. Right. As the numbers creeped up there too, but yes, but there were several people moved in after that decision was made into the fifth grade. It, it's, it's very interesting um, how much people want to be in the district they move to. That is a No, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, yes, I was going to talk a little bit about school, school safety because um, this is something that I want you to be aware of that this is a, um, certainly a, a big focus this year at the administrative level and will be at the school level. Um, we'll talk more about this at the next meeting as well, uh, talking about some of the conversation we had earlier. But this is something that's not been on the agenda of, for administrative meetings from the summer through now. To give a little historical context, back in I think it was 2009, because we actually got the report finished in 10. We, we received, an, it was a $99,000 federal REMS grant. And when we, when we had that grant, we, d we looked at lots of things. Um, first of all, we, we wanted to get all of our procedures, protocols, um, standardized, clarified, codified, and do a lot of professional development in terms of how you do crisis managing. That's, that's about the time when we also started be, to begin doing lockdowns and um, expanding the different ways that we did evacuations. But for example, one of the things that happened in the Brennan's grant was we had these uh, emergency um, uh, booklets that are in every single classroom. We've, we've actually taken an inventory this fall to see which classrooms, because uh, we've had more classrooms since then, to make sure that they are in every classroom and that, that teachers go over these booklets so they understand all the different kinds. Because it's, it's not just evacuation, there's, there's issues here around hazardous material spills, suspicious package, bomb threats. There's, there's a whole, there's a lot of medical explosions, medical emergencies, shelter in place. All of these different things are in this. Administrators, the principals, have a much larger crisis book. And one of the things that is in that crisis book is actually about communication in crises. And of course, that was one of the issues we had leaving last year was the issue around communication with respect to that incident at Stratton. So we have been talking about that. Um, this summer we wrote, uh, I got a lot of input from um, some support from the police department spokesperson, and we did some research at other districts. and compared to what we already had in place in our crisis book, we're developing a more clarified um, communications crisis protocols that was completed over the summer. The first draft went to the administrative team, a lot of suggestions, another draft will go back. So at some point you'll, in the next few weeks, you'll have a copy of this. Um, it's really basic, basically not that much different than we've had in place, but it just is much more specific um, about what needs to be done. So 
Ever since we all experienced the tragedy in Connecticut, Sandy Hook, we have really doubled down on making sure the doors are locked and even when mm -hmm. teachers go out for recess, they come back through, they have a key lock to come back through. Um, and so there's, there's all the physical parts. We've, we've put more cameras, there's, there's in the different school, in the elementary, certainly at the high school, you'll see a big difference in terms of the kind of vigilance that goes into people coming into the high school during the school day, the procedure they have to go through to get to sign in, get a badge, and that, that was something that just simply did not exist in the high school a couple of years ago. And you know, we learned, and we were basically improving that all the time in terms of what we're doing. But I think one of the things that's really important and to mention, and, it's, and it actually goes back to our earlier conversation with Cindy Bouvier and Colleen Ledger, and that is, it's what's, we can do all the physical safety, but what really is important is in terms of um, what we do to outreach to students. In, in any of these um, incidents where there's been shootings in school, something like 80% of the shooters had been students in that school or were currently students in that school. So that says a lot in terms of identification and, and creating opportunities for students to feel they belong there, that, that, that there's, there's um, someone that they can go to in the schools. And I think we've put a lot of effort in Arlington into doing that in terms of social workers in our schools, um, advisory programs, um, our transition programs, the diversion programs. We have lots of ways that we try to make sure that every student has an adult that they could go to. And even a survey last year says that, that confirms that that, at least in the high school, we haven't done one at the other, the other schools, but confirms that that is actually how the students feel. So I do want parents to understand that it's not just about making sure every door is locked, but it's really in terms of how do we help those students that we think that may be um, needing some, that, that may be at risk or may, may be feeling isolated in a school? How do we reach out to that student? And um, there is a lot of communication between AYCC, um, the Substance Abuse Council, the police department, um, in, in terms of sort of holding hands and trying to um, support these students and not have students feel isolated in the school. And that is really where the real work has to happen. I'm not saying the other is not important. It is important. It's not an either or situation. It is all of these things have to be happening at the same time. So I just want you to be aware that, um, and the community be aware, so they're listening, that we really have this year been focusing on really shoring up our protocols, making sure the people who are new to the system who may not have gotten our initial trainings are very aware of the protocols um, that go on in, in different, um, in, in our different schools. And this year we're also going to, we haven't done this in a couple of years, we're gonna actually do some, uh, we, we certainly have fire drills, but this year we're gonna practice every school where you go to your staging, your evacuation site. So. Just wanted to give you an update on that and some more to come as we go through the year. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so request. In which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 15035 dated 9-18-2014 in the amount of $623,551.78. Approval of draft minutes, May 22nd, 2014, September 4th, 2014, and September 18th, 2014. Approval of New York City trip for Arlington High School uh, FE students, December 5th through the 7th, 2014, with Mary Villano. Approval of Florida trip for Audison students from April 18th to April 22nd, 2015, Jay Crafts. Approval of Philadelphia for an annual Penn State Model Congress Conference on March 26th through the 29th, 2015, 
R. Hale and R. Bradley. So moved. I'd, I'd like to pull all the trips out, please. I want all the trips out? Yeah. Pulled 9, 18, 14 minutes. Okay, just is it 9, 18, just that one, 9, September 18th? Yep. And you want the, uh, the three trips pulled, okay? Those that have not been removed, uh, motion has been made. Has there been second to approve them? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, let's pick up with September 18th, uh, 2014 minutes. Mr. Pierce? I'd just like to abstain. Okay. Uh, You'd like what? She's abstaining. Okay, so uh, <laughs> move to approve uh, minutes uh, for September 18th, 2014. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? Aye. Thank you. One minute still? Sorry. Yes, sorry. Dr. Amby, do you want to take each one separate? No. Okay. We did not get a copy of the September 4th. No, we didn't. Not in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we're not approving those. Yeah, don't okay, September 4th, <laughs> 2014 minutes will not be approved because the members did not get a copy. All right, so we approved the warrant in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, two minutes. One, one. Two with one minute. Two, yeah, two, right, okay, all right. As soon as Karen tells me we we're ready to go, we'll... Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Dr. Uh, Campy? I don't have a problem with these trips specifically. What I wanted to know is who is vetting the trips from the administration um, that they're considered reasonably safe for our students and, and um, besides the teachers who are pr proposing them? Well, all of the, tri the trip come to my office. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the new ones we have this year is the one that's going to be the Florida Adventure. So, that, so not only do I see it, but the principal of the school sees it as well. Um, oh, okay, so if it comes to us, it's been seen by oh, yeah. at least the principal of the school and you, yes. mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. that, that's, I just wanted to know that it was it doesn't just go to, uh, to Karen. Right, <laughs> right. It's, we don't have, you know, it never says, it's not like stamped or right, approved. Right, right. No, you're right, you're right, you're right. And, right. and I question. just I realized question. I wanted to be sure. Okay, okay. that's all. Mm -hmm. uh, entertain a motion to approve the three trips as stated before. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Third. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous. Committee reports. Okay. Just waiting for the nod to go forward. Right. Why? We're going into committee reports. Is that okay with you? Okay. okay. Uh, Paul is in procedure, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will be meeting as a subcommittee on October 28th. Uh, it's a Tuesday at 5:30 um, to discuss um, uh, file E, specifically EBC with emergency plans, uh, to discuss school committee meetings with regard to electronic uh, submissions of documents. Um, to discuss uh, entrance age, JEB. Those are the three things I think we're going to focus on that night. Okay. Could are be some you, modifications between now and then. Are you aware that Adam is working on a uh, policy for uh, the agenda and stuff? Good. I'll, I'll be happy to talk to him. Yep. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Starks? Um, budget, budget met on September 30th, um, and you all have um, as one of your attachments the yearly budget calendar. Um, I'm just going to walk you through it tonight. We will approve it next meeting. Um, and the budget calendar, kind of the way I laid it out, was um, starting in September. For each meeting, what I tried to do was show you in bold things that are um, the uh, job of the school committee. And, um, and I tried to left align those. And then I right aligned things that come to us and we see in our meetings but don't necessarily require any um, you know, they're mostly informational for us. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, the first meeting in October today, we are going to introduce uh, the first draft of the budget calendar. That's what we're going through right now. Um, and next week, hopefully, we will uh, approve it. Um, so if anybody has any changes to this while we're going, just let me know. Um, then um, we will get final enrollment numbers in October. Mm -hmm. 
Um, then in November, our two meetings, the first meeting, uh, we should have projections for the town on our enrollment impact um, so that we can talk to them about funding numbers. Um, and then at the second meeting, we should start, we'll start to hear from the principals. Um, so on November 20th, we will hear from elementary and special education about um, their net needs and priorities for next year. Um, and then we get the other half on December, our first meeting in December, uh, which will be December 4th. Um, I am also working on, uh, in November, setting up a meeting. We did this last year with FinCom um, for the end of year report um, for last year, and then kind of giving them a first blush at kind of what's, what we're looking at for next year. Just some discussions about kind of where we see stresses. Obviously, enrollment is a big stressor, um, and those kinds of things. So having that meeting. Um, I have been in touch with Mr. Tosti, but he's out of town until the 15th, so he said he would get back to me on that one when he gets back. Um, and um, so after we hear from both the principals and department heads in November and December, then at our second meeting, we talk about the, um, basically what we have for priorities. So anything that, you know, do you think that you want to talk about, you want to make sure that the um, superintendent has heard it, whether it's coming from you or people that you've been talking with. Um, and we are also working on um, possibly in December and January, figuring out how we might be able to collect some public input on the budget. Um, then on the next page uh, is the rest of the year. January, our first meeting, we would set the school committee priorities for the budget um, and deliver basically our first budget number to town meeting although I know that's more symbolic than anything else. Um, January 2nd, nothing uh, budget-wise happens. Um, February, uh, the first meeting, we get our first look at budget details, so that's coming uh, from the superintendent and uh, Ms. Johnson. And the second, we would actually he have our budget hearing in our second meeting in February. Um, in March, we would have a final vote on the budget and approve anything that's gonna go to the meeting with FinCom, which will be either the 16th or 18th of March. Um, and uh, then basically we are in waiting until we get final approval from the town meeting in May. So I don't know if anybody has any comments, suggestions, changes. So things obviously that are not at a specific meeting don't happen at the meeting but happen during that month. That's how I tried to lay it out. No? All right, so next meeting we will um, uh, talk more about that or, or do a final approval. I also wanted to bring up, I don't know how many of you saw it, there is a public schools license plate that is, um, yes. yes, that, um, and so the way it works is the first year you buy the plate, it's $40, 12 of that goes to the state, but 28 of it actually goes to the local school district. Now, I want to find yeah. out if it's going to come right to the town or right yeah. into our pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Great Good question. point. And every year after that, the town gets the full $40, because yeah. it's only the cost of the plates that that mm -hmm. make it any less mm -hmm. the first year. Mm -hmm. um, they have to get a 1,000 orders before they'll even start to run them off. Mm. So I want to, and it's a lovely little, it says PS Public Schools with a little apple on it. Um, so anybody who doesn't yet have a special plate and feels like they wanna you know, possibly uh, give public schools, and it, go, it does go directly to your district. It doesn't mm -hmm. go to the state in any way. Somehow it's supposed to come to the district. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to put a plug in for those. Yeah. I think that's great. The, there was one mention to be, anyone that subscribes, be very careful that you give it to, designate the school you want it to go to. Right. School district, yeah. yeah. There's a line there that right. says yeah. specifically yeah. what district. Yeah. Um, and then also at our meeting, we were talking about, um, uh, you may or may not be aware, they are um, looking at the foundation budget. And I know you had an update. You said. Uh, yes, I've been talking to John Garbley, and he uh, is trying to arrange a meeting with uh, Senator Jalen. Is that pronunciation? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. And we just wanted to know if anybody was interested in, in attending that meeting, if, if you let me know. Depending on what it is, it's always fun to be with Senator Jane. I know, yeah. she's yeah. awesome. She's great. <laughs> when, it, when is it? Uh, we're not sure yet. We don't yet. know yet. But oh, she, okay. we, we're going to try to set up a meeting because she is on that committee. Okay. Sean okay. is working on it. So. Okay. I'd love so. to meet. Yeah. Okay. So we'll let you know. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, and we don't have a next meeting set up yet. For some reason, yet. my machine just crashed. 
Can I borrow yours Bye, just with, with, the, with the next it. committee report? No. Is, oh, is right here, right, right here. Oh, it. thank you. Yeah. Go back to the paper. Community relations, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, community relations met on October 1st. We discussed the uh, parent survey that we're going to do. Uh, the superintendent brought forth uh, a proposal from the National Center from School Leadership, which would provide the survey and actually do it, tabulate it. And the advantage of this is that you're able to compare your results to a, a national norm. So there, there's, a, there's an external baseline and we're able to add 10 questions of local interest to it. Uh, and after the discussion, uh, the, the subcommittee was pretty confident that we should go ahead and do this. It's a uh, superintendent's decision, so it doesn't require a vote, but she did want our feedback on that. Um, we will reconvene on October 15th in this very room at 5.30 p.m. to take a look at the survey questions, to take a look at what the 10 local questions we might want to add to this would be. Um, and we'll also talk a little about planning a parent forum uh, that was part of our, the goals uh, on the Common Core new assessments and to start talking about a district dashboard as well as planning future activities for the subcommittee. Just a quick question. Uh, will you be bringing the, this, are you gonna discuss those 10 questions or bring, bring them forward for a uh, discussion Yeah, that'd with be us? great. Um, so what's the timing on that? How's that? I, I don't know that we want to go and sit in a full committee meeting discussing the merits of individual survey questions. Not, I'm yeah. talking about the 10 extra that we The 10 have. extras, I, yeah, I, I don't know that we'd wanna sit here parsing survey questions. Uh, so I would recommend folks who want input on that to come to the subcommittee meeting. Right, um, the only problem with that is three of us are gonna be down the hall in a negotiation meeting a half hour prior to that. Well, that's okay, you can uh, you take a break because negotiations are 10 minutes on and a two hour wait, you know. No, not no. the way we. No, this is a prep. Oh, oh, you're, oh, we're. Uh, Our prep is only going to oh, take 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Minutes. Well, in any case, come on down. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, okay, fine. You know, I understand. Yeah, have fun. But, you know, okay. the, you know, this is too much sausage making for, you know, uh, uh, for, <laughs> for, for, for a formal meeting. The, the one thing I would like to do is while I have the floor is uh, ask for an agenda item for the next meeting. Sure. Uh, we have sent you off. Mm -hmm. to be our delegate at the MASC conference. Yes. And uh, uh, the uh, delegate manuals arrived in the mail, so perhaps we should have an agenda item. Should we wish to direct our delegate to vote uh, on certain items? The other thing is, is wait, that, wait, yeah. Just clarify, do all of you have your, uh, the, what he's just talking about, the agenda items for the MASC? The delegate manual. The delegate manual, you should have got it in the mail a mm -hmm. week or two ago, Paul? I don't know, I empty my mailbox once a week whether I need to or not, okay. but you know. If you, it, I, I would ask you if you can't find it. It's, it's, on, it's online on the MASC okay, website. Fine. So on. if we uh, can send the link so Karen can include it, that yeah, would okay. be awesome. Somebody. But yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, one of them is the resolution that we <laughs> co-sponsored with a couple of other committees, so of course we're gonna be voting yes so on that. you want me to be active for that one? Oh yeah, I, uh, absolutely, and um, okay. you know. That was good. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, sure. how can we find out what the questions are that are already on the uh, We'll get that oh. as well. Okay. Uh, we, we hope that we'll have them by, by, by then. Uh, we had sample questions. We didn't have the full, full range. So hopefully, we, we anticipate getting them because they're gonna need to do the survey pretty quickly after that. There's a timeline that they've committed to. Right. All set? Yeah. Curriculum instruction and assessment accountability. Nothing to report. Yeah. Facilities. So we will have a meeting, um, <laughs> and I will get the doodle out and get a, get uh, something that works. Great. Special study group on superintendent's valuation. I uh, just reminded of the full committee, you have to have your valuation to me by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Electronically, hard copy. You I don't would prefer care. electronic. Are we sending out an electronic form uh, for this purpose? Well, wait a second. We did. Yes. Oh, we did. Karen yeah, sent it to everybody. Oh, okay. oh really? Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we did. Uh, so what's the deadline in that uh, end of the end month? End of this month. It's supposed to be at the end of the month so I can do a compilation. I would like to put an agenda item uh, for the next meeting for us to briefly discuss how we want to do that the 13th. Right. 
whether it's just me presenting the compilation, I would then need to give it to you all prior to it. But, um, I don't know how we're going to do that. Uh, we're, again, we manage to enter new territory every year we get into this. Uh, so yeah, it is kind of, we've, yeah. a brief discussion on that. Thank yeah, you. But that's again, a good idea. Send it. Um, I'm, I think we yes. should get a reminder with the deadline and when to send I it. I printed it and wrote okay. on it, but okay. I have okay. I'll it. speak to Karen about that and get a, I, I just a, an email out to you all. Yeah, I mean, just at the end of the month, we're going to set deadline. <laughs> so you have to. Right. Uh, under the chair, uh, we, uh, Ms. Ampey and I went to a superintendent's coffee in Roxbury uh, the other night. Um, would you like to speak a little bit to that, or do you want me to? Oh, I forgot I was speaking to that. So okay. we went to, um, it was the Metco superintendent's, I, superintendent, coffee. superintendent's coffee, um, mm -hmm. and it was awesome. Uh, we got to meet some Metco parents and some um, Was it just our district or all kinds of It was anybody? just our district. Oh, just our district. Just our district. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, Margaret Thomas. Uh, Right, Margaret Thomas this. was there, um, and it was a chance for for us to have conversation and answer questions with the Metco parents, um, and just um, well, talk. There was a Q and A for, with Dr. Bodie. Yes. They had some some really important questions mm -hmm. related mm -hmm. about uh, traveling and parent conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, they get out of work, they have their family, and they're mm -hmm. expected to be here at six o'clock. Uh, Dr. Bodie offered some suggestions she's looking into, which I think uh, would be very positive for all of us. One of the questions came up, uh, basically support for the program. And uh, from what I've heard from this group, uh, we're, we're behind it 100%. And uh, I think they felt really, I saw Ms. Thomas the next day, and she said they were very happy to hear that enthusiasm from school committee members. They've heard it from Dr. Bodie in the past, but uh, to hearing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're having, uh, I'll, I'll put a pitch in for them, a fundraiser uh, for Thanksgiving, and they're making uh, sweet potato pies. I ordered one. Uh, we have forms. If anyone wants, I will pick up. Uh, so uh, there are two types and, uh, <coughs> so on that piece. I agree. They were very happy that you both made the effort to come in. And we yeah. also had two members of our um, my diversity committee come in as yeah. well, which was <laughs> terrific. And that gave... Um, Virginia Keynes the opportunity to tell them about the today's uh, students tomorrow's teachers program we have mm -hmm. and, uh, what was surprising to me it took 36 minutes to get from my house in there at uh, 5 o'clock mm -hmm. and uh, it took 34 minutes to get out so mm -hmm. it, uh, Dr. Ampey navigated thank goodness because <laughs> we'd be still in Boston if it was left to me uh, I would also like to uh, report on a uh, CPAC had a monthly meeting uh, at Jason Russell House. Uh, uh, Ms. Elmer was there, Elmer, excuse me, was there also. I found it very positive. I had to leave a couple of minutes early for another meeting. I don't know if you want to say anything about it. Uh, no, I, I think um, we were, mm -hmm. shortly after you left, we had also concluded the meeting. However, um, we talked about ways to increase outreach. Um, to draw more families into the pack, but also how to bridge um, families who are placed in programs in buildings that may not be their neighborhood school. So how we can, you know, increase their sense of um, integration in that building, and, and and sometimes even more for the adults. Would you think? I mean, or just the, but. Um, I think the, the families themselves wanted to feel more included in the school and the event. And so that was. And I, I personally, being involved in it for the past three years, see uh, a lot of growth between the school and this organization uh, in a very positive sense. Uh, and uh, it, it's growing. Okay. okay. At this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. That's why I was.